Cops of Reddit. What's the most bull sounding excuse you got that actually turned out to be true? Not a cop, but my dad rolls cigars. He uses this white powder called vegetable gum to seal the wrapper. You mix it with some water and it gets sticky and clear. In powder form it looks similar to see. My dad had a massive bag on him after a rolling event one night and got pulled over for a traffic violation. They saw the bag of powder laying in a box and asked what it was. And my dad told them. I guess they didn't believe him because they called back up. They had my dad cuffed while they tested it. And sure enough it came back as not C. They let him go. But it still cracks me up hearing the story. Not a cop. But my dad rolls cigars. Lol wax sentence. Had a domestic in progress I responded to during Christmas day and the excuse for them fighting was we're not mad at each other, we're just upset because we wanted to surprise the kids for Christmas. We got some deer, dressed them up, now they're destroying our house. It turns out there was literally three fully grown white tailed deer in the house somehow dressed with full bell harnesses like Santa's reindeer. I had to call the game wardens down who were then able to help me remove the deer from the property without injury to us or them. How they managed to get the deer and dress them up is still a mystery to this day. Okay, so legit answer. One night I'm out working, and as I go down the street, fairly nice middle class area surrounded by some high crime neighborhoods, around midnight I see a dude on a bike, no lights on, pulling a lawnmower behind him on a rope. I immediately flip a 180 and light him up. Recognize the guy as a local homeless dude with some prior burglary theft arrests. I walk up and just open with dude, come on. Guy holds his hands out and swears he didn't steal the lawnmower. Claims someone just gave it to him. I ask who, and he doesn't know a name. So I demand he tell me where to find said lawnmower owner. The directions he gave were literally go that way a bit, then right at a stop sign and take one of those side streets that way. It's about halfway down a street, at a house that has a pickup and a car in the driveway. By this point backup had arrived, so I'll leave him in the presence of backup, and drive off in search of his mythical donor of lawn equipment. I made a decent guess as to the first turn, then flipped a mental coin as to which of the next three side streets he would have gone down. I pick the second of the three streets, and start down it. Every other freaking house has a truck and car combo. There must have been a dozen houses that matched the description. Halfway down, I see an average looking house and go EHH. I'll try this one. After all, it's midnight and this is a wild goose chase. Go up, ring the doorbell. Middle aged dude comes to the door. Hello sir, have you been giving away lawnmowers to random sketchy homeless guys at midnight today? Yes, as a matter of fact, he had. Homeowner goes on to complain to me that his wife was upset as his continual inability to get the mower running, and had ordered him with some severity to remove the mower from the house or face the consequences. He pushed it to the curb right as homeless guy rode by, and the latter had asked and received his permission to take it. I drove back in shock and amazement, apologized to homeless guy, and sent him on his way. A few months later we ran into each other at a nearby gas station, and he told me it turned out just to need a new spark plug, and that he had gotten it running again, before going on to sell it for $150 to someone. For years after, whenever I would run into him, he would always make sure to remind me of the money he made from selling that stolen lawn mower, lol. Man the odds of guessing the right street and house. One of the funnier ones that I remember. We got a call for a kid. He was 18 and a gang member, brandishing a firearm. He had pulled up his shirt pretending to brandish a firearm to intimidate somebody. The person calling only saw a holster. After we got there, he kept telling us it wasn't a gun but a corn cob. We took him down at gunpoint and he was right. He was walking around with a holstered, black dildo. Why? Because he could. Haha. <laughs> the bulls on this guy. Seriously. Not really an excuse, but shock the crap out of me. I've always been told a diabetic with high blood sugar acts the same as someone who is drunk. Get a call for a car all over the road. Hitting trash cans on the side of the road and whatnot. We stop the car and get the driver out. He's slurring his speech like no other. Can't maintain his balance to save his life. Fails all the sobriety tests, but blue zeros on the PBT. He denied drinking and swears up and down he didn't do any drugs. Never mentions the diabetes. 
We're all scratching our heads and I remember the blood sugar thing. Call medical to our location and sure as crap his blood sugar was 550. And he finally remembers that he hadn't taken insulin in 8 hours. My dad is an officer and he pulled someone over for speeding and running a red light and they said their breast implant burst. He called EMS to rush them to the hospital and turned out it did and it's actually very dangerous if they leak. Not the cop in this story, but someone crashed into a tree on their way to work and most people have an excuse as to why they weren't at fault when they crash. In this particular case the woman said an owl flew into her car and she swerved off the road into a tree. Anyway, said cop gets into the car to move it for the tow truck and sure enough an owl flies from the back seat past the officer's face and out the front window. Surprises the cop. Scared the crap out of him I imagine. The owl was included in the diagram of the accident report. I wanna see this diagram. Not a cop. I am an attorney. I had a client who agreed to cooperate in a criminal matter. He was charged in a drive-by shooting. As part of the cooperation he had to divulge where his gun came from. He told the prosecutor that he found it in a tree. The prosecutor got angry at the response. He began to lambaste my client. When the detective said, wait, I had a case where the shooter claimed to have hidden his gun in a tree, but it wasn't there when we went to get it. He asked my client where the tree was located. Same tree. I was as surprised as the prosecutor that he had told the truth. Was doing a tour as an MP. Not my normal job, but whole other story. And we got called on a domestic. At the house. There is this huge corn fed guy about 6 feet 4 inches and 275. And a petite Asian girl about 4 10 inches and 95 pounds soaking wet. The whole house was in disarray, and the call had come because of yelling heard by the neighbors. She was crying and talking in an Asian language that none of us understood, and kept gesturing toward her huge husband. He wasn't talking. We wrap him up, take him to the station, and are trying to interview him, but he's not saying much. We intend to charge him with domestic assault. We notice somewhere along the way that he has horrible welts all along the backs of his hands and along his forearms. It took a lot of prying. But we finally got out of him that his wife would beat him with wire coat hangers when she was mad. And apparently that was pretty often. He was too embarrassed to admit to anybody that he was being abused by his wife who was less than a third of his size. We finally got it straightened out, turned her over to the local police, and barred her from base. Hopefully the guy got the help he needed. Not a cop. Family friend was. Pulled a guy over who was speeding profusely. Guy was obviously disheveled. He said he was headed to the hospital because he had a tick on his dong. Cop was confused, but he escorted him there. Then waited in the lobby to check on him see if he was blowing smoke. After a while, he asked the desk what was going on. Why it took so long to take a tick off his penis. Her reply, it wasn't on it, it was in it. Popped a college kid for crappy driving and pulled a hundred grams of weed off of him. Also, a one pound glass pipe shaped like a huge nail. No biggie. Also find weed under the other college kids in the car. Driver falls on the sword and tells me all of it is his and lets his friends walk free. I like this kid. However during the search we find package that is in the cellophane of a cigarette pack with the top melted closed. Goddamn it intensifies. Ask kid if he's dealing at ease at school. Tell him I'm aware of the prescription pill epidemic. He says no and spins a huge yarn about how he only carries a few on him because he's had his orange pill bottle stolen so many times. Kid seems like a pretty good dude. I decided to take the X-Files approach. Supervisor tells me pursue charges for dealing. Blah blah blah. I tell the kid he has one chance to prove he's telling the truth. Shows me the broken glass under his driver's seat from a vehicle burglary. Go to do better. I follow behind him back to his dorm. He lets me in and shows me the busted footlocker he kept them in under his bed. Dunno. Kinda weak. Supervisor's telling me to hurry and and drop the axe. Tell him to do better. He calls one of the soccer team assistants up and we meet him in the locker room. Shows me the little wooden locker which has a broken lock. Ed, assistant coach tells me they have replaced the lock on his cabinet three times. Campus security has numerous reports of medicine theft from this kid. Nice. I call supervisor up and tell him I have no grounds to pursue delivery charges. Poor bastard just kept getting his Adderalls jacked and being the big dumb meatball he was. He started packaging them like that. I end up talking to his best friend breaking up a house party a couple months later. 
Friend tells me kid is a stand up guy who only uses we due to extreme anxiety. Totally believable from my interaction with him. And has never sold anything in his life. Friend thanked me and told me his buddy spoke well of me. Friend also tells me he had to drive his buddy to the hospital a few hours after I left from a panic attack due to the whole incident. I felt bad for the kid. So now, whenever I see him smoking up in his car in the mall parking lot I just wave. When do we put you in charge of all police? Former cop here. I was behind a vehicle that couldn't stay in the lane. Kept swerving, etc. It was 1am, and I think another drunk idiot on the road. Pull him over. Guy is a straight up butthole to me. Cursed me out, yelling at me, and I notice his speech is slurred. I get him out to car, and I can smell a fruity smell on his breath and he has to lean against the car for support. I ask him how much he had to drink and he tells me to frick off. By this point I am ready to bring him in for a DUI, but I just had a feeling something wasn't right. I called Ems to come check him. Blood sugar was at 40, not drunk, just a diabetic. If I would have arrested him, he probably would have died before I finished the paperwork. Go with your gut if something doesn't seem right. Not a cop but I did get stopped by one for eating a taco. I worked at a community college in La that had a high school right next to it. Well there was a lot of drugs sold through the fence at the high school. So there was always a cops driving up and down the street between the schools. Couldn't get a parking pass since I just worked at the school so I always parked on that street. Hit up Taco Bell for lunch and was sitting in my car eating my double decker tacos when a cop drove past. Next thing I know he's flipping a U-turn and heading right for me. He slides to a stop driver window to drive a window and yells at what the heck do you think you're doing stunned I just said eating my lunch. Well he isn't buying it and says I'm hiding something. I just hold up my taco and looked so confused. He burst out laughing and peeled out. Saw him a few times after that and he always waved and had the biggest grin on his face. Not a cop but I have a very common name and got pulled over for driving across the medium and there was a warrant out for me for rape and assault or something. As it turns out a guy with the exact same name and birth to born in the same city as this and it took me about 20 minutes of pleading to get the officers to realize I did not match the description. I deal with this dude every once in a while as it turns out our socials are off by one digit. If I ever see him we are going to have a long talk. Good god how the heck. It's like the opposite of having a look alike. My first ever real call was for a flasher at the local park. When I got there and finally found him it was a mentally impaired young man 16-17 who had a pair of headphones on in a full poo bear. I said hey man come here what the heck is going on you know you have to keep your pants on especially at the park. He goes on to tell me he had bad itching down his pants and couldn't take it anymore so he had to rip his pants off and was running home to get help. I said come on you couldn't make it home first. He said no I had ants in my pants. Ashore as crap according to more than one witness's account. He had been sitting in a sandbox playing at the park and accidentally on a nest of red ants that had crawled up his pant legs. I love that this was your first call. I'm running booking one night. Guy gets brought in for possessing a truly stupendous amount of drugs. I am talking like two rubber maytoads full of shrooms, a huge bag of weed, and enough H to overdose half the county. Well, says he, I'm a D informant and they told me to make the drop so they could be there and raid the crap out of everybody and let me go for helping. Aha, uh -huh. re i i i t. Faith left please. Guy is like I'm telling you dude, fear gonna be su u -pa -pee that you country retards fricked up fire bust. But whatever. Get in the holding cell and shut up. About 3 hours later 3 guys show up. D agents. Fear super p that our deputies fricked up fire bust. I go back to the holding cell to let the guy out. And he's just like fear super p huh. Yeah, told you so. Former US Coast Guard, and actually did law enforcement. For those unfamiliar, the Carolinas in the states and especially Wrightsville Beach, Myrtle Beach, New Topsail, Lockwood's Folly along the NCSE border are overflowing with drunken or stupid boaters during the summers. Especially with UNCW nearby, drunk college kids on the water everywhere doing reckless crap. BWIs, illegal charters, freaking around outside of the channel, cutting bows, speeding, ignoring no wake zones and even the odd drug trafficking illegal firearms trafficking charges. Suffice it to say, combined with hurricane season, we were quite busy from May September. 
One Friday afternoon Arod gets a call out on channel 16, like 9, 1, 1 for boaters, from a captain calling in a pontoon boat that has flipped and 20 young, intoxicated males in the water. We arrive on scene with another 47 feet from a nearby station and are fishing these drunk idiots from the water. They pack 24 people on board a 14 person pontoon boat and of course it flipped, as we're pulling them out. Literally all of them were drunkenly threatening us with their daddy's law firm. It was like a crappy 90s teen MTV romcom come to life. We just rolled our eyes, zip tied them, didn't pack enough cuffs and 90% of them were combative drunk even seeing the pistols on our hips rifles shotgun slings. Turns out it was an entire frat of future lawyers studying at Ellen whose fathers were all lawyers as well. Still didn't save them from the local US attorney and reckless operation of a boat, BWI, and license captain, ETC charges. Still was surreal with dozens of drunk 20 year old dudes wailing and telling us their daddy would sue us. Don't even get me started on jet skier stories. Not a cop but I had a run in with one that was really funny once. When I was 18, I was on a double date with a friend, and we stepped out of a restaurant to smoke. A cop came up and started harassing us, telling us there had been break ins into cars in the area. Eventually, he said he needed to pat us down, and he pulled a brown paper bag out of my friend's pocket. He got a smug look on his face and asked, so, what's in here? Huh, my friend said, the emancipation proclamation with a completely straight face. The cop opened the bag, pulled out a small booklet, got embarrassed, and let us go. My friend had been to the Lincoln Museum earlier that day and did actually have a small copy of the emancipation proclamation in his pocket. Mid July and like 2008, young kid going 93 in a 55, I swing and he immediately pulls over, approaching the car, his first words before I can even start speaking, my dog died, he hung himself, I gotta get back before my mom gets home, what jpg, anyway, he calls other family members, his aunt, uncle and two cousins come out to the stop and between all their sobbing, they verify that the dog had actually hopped over the fence on a leash runner and couldn't get back over. Everyone's crying now. They showed me a photo on their phone. Apparently they found the dog and called the kid at work and he just left. I didn't even bother verifying further than that. Cousin drove the kid's car back so they could take care of the dog and prepare for mom. Some said that I should have wrote him, but losing an animal sucks enough. He knew he fricked up and adding financial burden to him wasn't going to help him or me. I'm glad there are cops out there who understand both how horrible losing a dog is and how financially hard it is to get a ticket as a kid. Insurance is already too high. Of course kids should be more careful and it's not the cops fault they got pulled over. But you did the right thing in this scenario. I was driving with my fiancé and we went through a roadblock where they checked registration and crap. And we get to the cops and they ask for our registration. I'm sitting in the passenger seat so I open up the glove box and right there is a clear and marked baggie filled to the brim with catnip. I completely forgot it was there and just froze. Wide eyed. I turned to look at the cop shining his light through my open window and he's frozen too. Just staring at the baggie with this look on his face like really? I just started immediately professing omg I swear to god this is catnip. You can take it and smell it or test it or whatever like I swear. And at this point it's just so ridiculous that I start cracking up. And the cop takes it and reasonably deduces I'm telling the truth. And he starts laughing and calls his partner over and tells her what happened and they both just cackled away for a minute and sent us on our way. Catweed. Good thing they weren't cat cops. My dad was a cop and my favorite story of his goes like this. He's a young cop in a rough neighborhood. It's so late that the stoplights are flashing red, meaning treat it like a stop sign. Out of nowhere this pink caddy goes rolling through the intersection. My dad pulls him over. A big black dude was driving. The caddy had fur interior, dice in the mirror. A real pimp car if you know what I mean. My dad goes so do you know you ran that light back there and this guy says officer. I do believe I got between the flashes. My dad was laughing so hard he had to let the guy go. I can just imagine the dude's thought process when he saw the flashing red light. Cop here. Got a call of a domestic dispute that sounded very heated and a lot of banging was heard. Get a scene and I can hear someone yelling and swearing and brawling. Doesn't sound good at all. 
Guy answers the door, shut off and angry, but seems bewildered as to why police had been called. He told me he was building IKEA furniture, sounds like the most bulls thing, but we enter, see the new IKEA furniture half set up and no one else is home. Color me surprised. Oh man, totally been there before haha. <laughs> This was my favorite story from my 4th grade teacher, not a cop. She went to her cousin's wedding in mid-July. The cousin had overestimated how much champagne they would need at the reception and was giving away bottles to anyone who was interested. So my teacher took three and put them in the backseat of her car. Again, this was a hot summer day in July. After saying their goodbyes, my teacher, her husband, and her parents piled into the car and pulled out onto the highway, where two bottles burst open spraying champagne everywhere and causing quite a ruckus. Of course while this was happening, the car was swerving as the driver was also getting bathed in sparkling champagne. So it came as no surprise that as soon as they collected themselves, they saw the familiar flashing lights of a state trooper and pulled over. According to my teacher, the first thing the cop said was I'm not gonna ask if you've been drinking because I can smell it from here. My teacher tried explaining what had happened. But the cop wouldn't hear of it and ordered everyone out of the car. That's when the cop saw that everyone, both drivers and passengers, were dressed in their finery, but soaked with champagne, and looking quite shaken. A cursory search showed the open bottles, but the cop still insisted on a quick sobriety check just to make sure. That must have been a sight. Police of Reddit, what is the absolute worst crime scene you've come across? Not a cop but I am in college to become one. One of my professors at the time worked homicide as a lieutenant at the precinct and brought in crime scene photos all the time to show us on the projector. One was of this 17 year old kid who'd had his head caved in on the early 2000s. It was a pretty big case at the time in Philadelphia. He worked construction part time and walked home every Friday with a couple hundred dollars in cash for his pay. His best friends, one girl and two guys, all in the 1618 range, wanted to make a quick buck. The girl lured him to this regular meetup spot for fricking near some woods. When he started taking his clothes off, the three friends jumped him. The 18 year old guy if I remember right had a hammer, and his brother had a cinder block. Kid didn't stand a chance. His parents had to identify him based on the clothes he was wearing because there was practically nothing left of his face or hands. Defensive wounds. The brother got tried as an adult and got 25 to life. The 18 year old got life. The girl got 15 for ratting out the other two. Yes, this is the case of Jason Sweeney. Probably the four suicides I've worked. My very first, a man who had recently been diagnosed with terminal cancer decided to prematurely end his life. He jumped in the early morning from a five-story parking structure. He landed in such a way that his brain pretty much popped out of his head. When we found him, his brain was fully intact but sitting in a puddle of blood exactly 23 feet from his body. He left a note apologizing to whomever finds my body and asking that his wife and daughter were cared for. The second, we got a suspicious circumstances call regarding a possible explosion next to a baseball stadium. It was a little after midnight, upon arrival, and not seeing any smoke or flames, I got out and walked around. There were big tents set up for a game the next day. I saw what looked like a person sitting in a chair in the middle of a tent. I called out to him and he didn't answer. As I approached, I put my flashlight on him and nearly soiled myself. The top half of his head was just gone. I walked under the tent and noticed a shotgun sitting next to him. As I was calling it in, I felt something like rain hit the top of my head. I shined my flashlight up and the inside of the top of the tent was absolutely coated with blood and brain matter. He did not leave a note. I still have nightmares about that one. The third. We got a report of a single gunshot in a field next to a church. I had a trainee at the time. It's about 2 o'clock. We drive next to the field and pretty quickly spotlight a body laying next to a lone tree. Pretty much the same thing as the last one. Top half of the head missing. Single shot 12 gauge sitting next to the body. He had sat down, leaned against the tree, and put the shotgun in his mouth. Brains and various red goo all in the branches of the tree. No note. And the most recent one. An rar at a dormitory had reported a bad smell to a maintenance worker. The maintenance worker keyed into a room on the first floor after knocking and getting no answer. He said when he opened the door, he recognized the smell and immediately called us. 
a paraplegic student had committed suicide by overdosing on prescription medication. We found him in his wheelchair with his head in the sink. Apparently he was vomiting into the sink, and the sink had clogged up. His head was partially submerged in vomit, and, as the AC was off, he was very, very ripe. I couldn't seem to get that smell out of my uniform no matter how many times I washed it. He didn't leave a note, but we found out later he sent a text message to a girl he was fond of. She ignored it, thinking he was just being dramatic. The mental health care system in my state is severely broken, overburdened, and rife with bureaucracy. Not my story but a friend's. He's received a call and responds about a single vehicle crash with only one survivor, and two victims. Here's what happened. Three high school students and childhood friends were driving to a gun range firing area. The one in the back had a shotgun in his hands. They go over a pothole. The shotgun fires and instantly kills the driver. The driver's dead weight hits the gas and they slam into a tree. The passenger, wearing no seat belt is ejected through the windshield and impacts a tree, breaking his neck and crushing his skull. They were two weeks from graduating high school. The surviving friend now attends therapy, medicated, and has attempted suicide at least once. My mom works in the mental health field and treats people with severe conditions. She began treating a police officer who is severely traumatized from a crime scene he was called to. Here's what happened. He receives a call from a woman crying hysterically. He responds to the home and walks in. The woman's husband is standing over her dead son, the man's stepson. And this guy is rooting cutting the kid's body apart with a knife. He is also muttering to himself. There's a shotgun and two expended shells on the floor. Apparently this guy who was a severe alcoholic and drug user, he did pretty well. However he also had paranoid delusions and after going off his meds became convinced that his stepson was being controlled by miniature aliens living inside his body. And it was his duty to find these aliens and kill them. So he called his stepson into the kitchen and killed him with two shotgun blasts to the chest and then proceeded to try to find the aliens. The mother returns home from work, sees what happened and immediately dials 911. Apparently this guy had killed the kid hours beforehand and had been picking at his body and crap for the entire afternoon trying to find the aliens. It the saddest scene was a fire where a number of children had died. There is nothing as sad and disturbing as seeing a lifeless child. The most grotesque scene was an obese man who died on the toilet and fell forward onto the lino floor. He lay there for 3 days. We had to peel him off the floor and what used to be his face and chest was now a large amount of maggots and goop. The scene that made me most angry was the home where the big fat husband had thrown his tiny wife around the place and put her head through the plasterboard of a wall. The sight of her cowering and him standing there laughing made my blood boil. Fortunately he violently resisted arrest. He didn't think he could be arrested in his own home. The most frustrating scene was the debauchery victim who was too afraid to name her attackers because they were connected to the IRA. That feeling when you can do nothing to bring such a heinous man to justice. My father was a cop for 25 years. He's seen some crap in his time. Here's what he thinks was his worst crime scene. A domestic murder where a husband attacked and killed his wife with hammer blows to the head. She was discovered by her children ages 4 and 7, who told their neighbors, who called the police. He was found on an industrial estate nearby, in his car, having expired Thoru breathing exhaust fumes. Worst accident scene, a 7 and a half ton goods vehicle lost control on a motorway, crossed all three lanes, went through the central reservation, hitting several vehicles on the opposite carriageway. One of these vehicles was a Mercedes Sprinter van. The impact flattened the Mercedes from the driver's side across the vehicle's back. The passenger walked away with a minor head injury. The driver's body had been stretched to approximately 9 feet long due to the impact force. The occupants of the 7.5 tunnel were both dead, the impact being on front driver's side corner diagonally across the cab. The driver was decapitated from his chin up. The passenger was decapitated from the middle of her nose up. Extracting the remains was an interesting experience. My dad was in a wreck like that. Big transport truck cratered his car. But my dad walks away from the wreck with minor injuries because he saw it coming and had the presence of mind to literally unfasten his safety belt and jump into the passenger side seat. It he hadn't he'd have been a red smear. Four uncles physically shaming two minor females. None of the uncles knew the other three were doing it. 
Of course, now that the young girls are in their 30s and have denounced the actions of their uncles, they've been banished from the family for telling the family secret. Oh my god. We had a kid, late teens, hang himself on Halloween on a hill visible to the whole neighborhood. Of course everyone thought it was a prop until someone complained that it was in poor taste and decided to check it out. Also a suicide with a high powered rifle. I was dispatched to go check on the guy because he was sending vaguely upsetting texts to his wife. As I was on my way I kept getting updates that the texts were escalating and finally a goodbye. Tell our son this isn't his fault. Crap. Guy shot himself under the chin as I was pulling up at the house. The shot split the front of his head in two. There was no surface in the garage that wasn't covered in brain matter. I can remember the smell of gun smoke in the air and the tiny plops of brain falling from the ceiling. The absolute worst part was when the coroner was examining the body on scene. We had to put him on his stomach. As we did, the split sides of his face were in such a way that they were splayed out on either side, and both eyes were looking back at us. I still have nightmares about that one. When I got back to the office to gear down for end of shift, I found that I had some of his brains on the back of my vest carrier. That went straight into the garbage. Also, not a scene per se, but we recovered an avalanche victim and found a GoPro on his helmet. GoPros were still a novelty at the time so we weren't quite sure what we'd find. I watched it and sure enough it caught the whole thing. The worst part was moments after we was buried, he realized what was going on and began screaming. I had to listen to the whole thing, in case he screamed out any messages for the family or anything. The screams were muffled inside the waterproof case, but still horrifying. Danish cop here. Some years ago a coked up driver hit a woman in central Copenhagen. She was hit with about 120 kmh while crossing the street with her boyfriend in hand. Her body flew about 100 meters down the street. On second thought I have removed parts of the description out of courtesy. When the first patrol car arrived at the place of impact, the boyfriend was sitting beside the body and caressing her head. They had to be three officers to pull him away from the woman. The driver was a well-known man that had done something close to this before. Two underage Danish girls was in the backseat of the car he hit her with. I ended up in a fight with one of them cause she wouldn't stop phoning different people while we still were chasing the driver in the area around the car. Oh and he could have killed about 10 people. About 20 seconds before he hit her, he drove through a red light at the busiest pedestrian crossing in Denmark. It was about 0100 on a Saturday night and it was the night the Christmas beer was released. He got a sentence of 4 years and 6 months. The longest sentence in Danish history for a hit and run. Prisons in Denmark only serve 3 stroke 4 of the sentence, and in the weekend he got to go home from prison. In the last year of the sentence, it's only a couple of months since the newspapers wrote that he hadn't returned to prison after a weekend at home. That's the lenient Danish prison system for you. I have two, but both not crime scenes. First decapitated body in a one vehicle RTC in concert Kodaram, England crashed into a stone wall and overturned somehow decapitating the driver. Second was a sudden death. In a flat the occupants in the downstairs flat complained of a leaking drain from upstairs. It turned out the person upstairs had died, rolled out of bed, and was decomposing on the floor. The leak was the various body fluids from the deceased. It wasn't all I ever saw, but certainly the worst. My career was effectively ended by a lady that got hit by a car. It basically ripped her whole face off, except her eyes, basically from the nose down. You could see her vocal cords. She was convulsing on the ground, and a crowd of people were standing around her. I was first there, and she was still alive. There was absolutely nothing I could do for her at that point. It was obvious she was bleeding out. I got down on the pavement, cradled her in my arms and told her she would be okay. While I tried to stop some of the bleeding, I knew I was lying. But I wanted her to not feel alone and scared when she died. She passed in my arms. As the medics showed up, they worked on her for a bit, but they called it before the chopper landed. Two weeks later I quit. I've had severe PTSD since then. I drink a lot to self-medicate. I go to therapy. I've lost almost all of my friends. And several jobs. I take pills every day for depression. Sorry for the vivid description. But you asked. I can still smell it. See it the works. What a brave, gentle loving gesture. 
Thank you for sharing this story. My friend passed away in a car accident, alone and in a foreign country. It eases my pain to think someone might have been there for them like you did to that woman. More love and strength to you. Private security here was patrolling the exterior of my building when I smelled it. Once you smell death, you never forget it. What's worse, it was coming from the trash compactor. We have a couple nice restaurants who toss their garbage into the compactor and a lot of homeless nearby. One of them saw the cooks tossing the garbage the night before and climbed in to grab it. However, the compactor is one of those that will activate when the door closes. Either he didn't know that or the wind got the door. Holy crap, the thought of being in that situation, seeing the compactor come down knowing you're all about to be crushed. Not a cop, EMT, had a call for pedestrian hit by car on rural road. We haul butt over there and find a 12 year old female in the road with her dad standing over her. She was riding her bicycle in her driveway with her whole family out in the lawn, rode into the road and was immediately hit by an older man driving a large old Cadillac. The car was driving at 55-60 miles per hour and because of the bicycle this girl hits the windshield, but her head hits the passenger side column. The girl doesn't die on impact and is instead bleeding out through the large piece of her skull that has been half caved in. The girl can't talk but she's blinking and making sounds. Her dad, who had been drinking for the better part of the day, sees the whole thing. He immediately runs out into the road and starts doing the only thing he's ever seen from TV. CPR. Thanks to his woefully drunk version of CPR, he not only crushes her ribs and lungs, but effectively helps her bleed out faster. To make things worse, I have a brand new paramedic with me, who has never seen anything like this. Almost as soon as we arrive this girl has no pulse and blood is everywhere. A volunteer firefighter showed up on scene and is trying to pull the dad off the girl. Dad and the firefighter get in a full on fight. We get there, assess her and try to control the bleeding but she's gone. No pulse, massive trauma, no lung sounds, head caved in, laying in a pool of blood bigger than she is. Her whole body is just broken. Another M's unit shows up and it takes me and the other crew to pull my partner away from the girl, who is grey. As soon as we pull him away, the father begins screaming about losing his little girl and runs into his house. The older man in the caddy, realizing she's dead, begins yelling oh my god I've killed a little girl, then things get worse. The old man in the caddy, who hit her, falls down on the pavement and has a massive heart attack. He dies an hour later. Meanwhile dad is inside the house drinking some kind of whiskey as fast as he can before coming back out bottle in hand, completely out of his mind, and attacking things in his yard. The girl isn't an only child, she's the second youngest of six, and all of them were outside watching this go down. Other units arrive on scene, we end up transporting dad, the driver of the caddy, and the volunteer firefighter, injuries sustained from holding back dad. I go out of my way to avoid that stretch of road. My partner quit a week later. Been to a few calls of dead bodies turning up at the water treatment facility. You think normal dead body smell is bad? Try a guy who has spent a week soaking in waste water dumped out onto a conveyor belt. Also went to a call of a guy, a vet with PTSD, who shot himself in the head in front of his wife when she demanded he go to a wedding. The rest of the family was in the other room. And by rest I mean about 15 other people. Apparently the last thing the wife said was, we're going to the wedding pack your bags and threw a suitcase at him. Well his Glock was in it and he simply pulled it out and shot himself right in the temple. Dude really didn't like weddings I guess. Just remembered a guy who got run over by a FedEx truck was basically degloved from the waist down. His right foot was by his right ear and his leg was straight. Also his disc was by his face. Another guy on PCP got into a wreck, had an almost completely amputated right foot, shattered right femur and a broken left ankle, took 5 of us to drag him to the ground and hold him till paramedics could hit him with a sedative. He actually was able to take about 5 or 6 steps before we got him on the ground. I rode in the ambulance with him. The medic kept picking UO his foot that was attached only by skin and letting it drop. One time he said OW. Just kept thinking. Now? Mother sucker your foot is off. You have no clue how much you just fricked up your life. My dad is currently sitting right by me. He has 20 years active patrol duty and then 7 as sheriff. Well, 
One time we got a call from guy saying his girlfriend broke his dong. Obviously, we were skeptical, so we go along with ambulance and fire to their house and walk into his girlfriend sobbing and shaking in the corner. We walk into the bedroom and let me tell you. Dongs might not be able to break but this was a very broken dong. Turns out they had gotten drunk and she wanted to hop on his dong by jumping from the top of their headboard onto him. Yep, didn't work. She bent his dong in half. By the time we got there it had turned black and people and the bottom part was swelled but the top part was just flopping. I felt bad for that guy. The other one was a call we got from this woman saying Mrs. Ziz is 90 years old and we haven't seen her in 7 weeks. Can you preform a wellness check this was in the middle of August after a couple streaks of 100 degree weather. 7 weeks is a long time. So me and Rich, his partner, go over and lo and behold no visible AC unit in this 100 year old house. So we load up our noses with Vicks and open the door. Yep, the Vicks didn't help. That house was well over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. This lady had basically melted into a sludgy mess with some human feature still visible on her couch. The vapor her body was giving off was on the windows like condensation. Rich and I both threw up and called the coroner who basically had to remove this lady with her couch cushions. It was bad. My dad was a cop and the worst case he ever had was while he was a detective. They caught a local teacher with something 8 full CDS of CP. The most awful thing about it that you have to go through it all. To see if you can identify any adults in the pictures to try and get them busted. Freaking sick. And if a child is identified the parents and child have to go through every photo and confirm it. It's horrible. Shameless plugs. Since this place is a freaking graveyard on the front page. Here's an older one submitted last month. Courtesy of you Candler Krisha. Comma an officer who volunteers at my work from time to time told me that his worst experience was during his first year on the job. Apparently there was a car accident where the driver was wedged halfway out of the overturned car. Unfortunately since the car was on fire, they couldn't help the man out and had to stand there and watch him burn to death while he screamed for them to help him. And another, thanks you corpse husband pastor and you slash 17 herp derp. Comma a call goes out for reported screaming it's mid January. Important later, my father and another office respond to find a known deranged individual. Very long rap sheet and has been in and out of psychiatric care for years. Sitting on the front porch holding a double sided wood splitting axe. Steam is coming up off the, the grass and there are chunks lying all over the lawn. Upon interviewing the suspect he admits that he and a friend were playing poker. The suspect was losing nearly every hand and came to the conclusion that his friend was a rage ain't. Southern for ghost and was cheating him. The suspect grabbed the axe and chased his friend outside and hacked him into dozens of pieces thus causing the warm blood to create steam on the grass. My dad tells the suspect that he needs to get in the police car because it's H ain't proof. He said the suspect dropped the axe and sprinted to get in the back seat while thanking them for helping him. TL. DR. My father convinced an axe murder to get in his cop car because it's ghost proof. He thought his friend was a ghost, but H ain't. My friend and his dad are volunteer firefighters. I was staying the night and they got a call at 1am. They knew it would be a long call based off of info from their radios. So I went with them. According to a witness. A motorcyclist going about 120 miles per hour was going around a wet corner at midnight past a semi truck. He leaned too much into the corner. Slid across the road. Still on his bike. Hit a tree. He disengaged from his bike when he hit the tree. And skidded in front of the semi, where the semi smeared him like spreading peanut butter on toast. I stayed in the truck with the windows down, but could see everything due to all the flashing lights. Semi driver was a wreck, crying and sobbing, saying that it happened so fast that he couldn't do anything. I got to watch my friend and his dad scrape a guy off the road. Drive safe guys, especially, motorcyclists. A friend of mine's dad is a cop. He told the story of one time he was called to investigate a fire that was lit in an alleyway. This was midday, he'd yet to eat lunch and had skipped breakfast, and upon arriving to the scene noticed a particularly appetizing aroma coming from the fire. His mouth was involuntarily watering. Turns out, the fire was an ignited carpet, rolled up, with a dead person inside of it. Journalist, not police, but I was often at the same sorts of scenes. One. Partial decapitation in a car accident. A drunk kid hit a small car at high speed, 
tore the top completely off. Driver's body was still heaving and convulsing in the front seat. Brains and tongues splattered over groceries in the back seat. 2. Hugely obese drug dealer goes into his attic to retrieve his stash. This is in Georgia in the summer. Collapses from the heat and dies. Takes neighbors a few days to notice the smell. Takes a few more before they figure out where, exactly, it's coming from. The police had to cut a hole in the roof of the house to pull his bloated corpse out. He fell apart into goo as they were doing it. The smell was insane even a quarter mile down the road, once the roof was opened up. 3. Woman who had been killed by a serial killer. Unofficially, the cops on the scene said they had seen this sort of thing a number of times so they thought it was a serial killing. Was never proven. She was a prostitute and he had beaten her to death and then tightly packed all of her orifices with dirt before dumping her. 4. Train vs car. A mom tried to beat a train with her kids in the car. Train was too fast. When I got to the scene there was a child's head just sitting on the ground. Completely normal except for the fact that his was detached and the body was nowhere in sight. People who try to beat trains are idiots. Police of Reddit. What is the absolute worst crime scene you've come across? I have two, but both not crime scenes. First decapitated body in a one vehicle RTC in Concert Co Durham England. Crashed into a stone wall and overturned somehow decapitating the driver. Second was a sudden death. In a flat the occupants in the downstairs flat complained of a leaking drain from upstairs. It turned out the person upstairs had died, rolled out of bed, and was decomposing on the floor. The leak was the various body fluids from the deceased. Private security here, was patrolling the exterior of my building, when I smelled it. Once you smell death, you never forget it. What's worse, it was coming from the trash compactor. We have a couple nice restaurants who toss their garbage into the compactor, and a lot of homeless nearby. One of them saw the cooks tossing the garbage the night before, and climbed in to grab it. However, the compactor is one of those that will activate when the door closes. Either he didn't know that, or the wind got the door. Holy crap, the thought of being in that situation, seeing the compactor come down knowing you're about to be crushed. My dad was a cop and the worst case he ever had was while he was a detective. They caught a local teacher with something 8 full CDS of CP. The most awful thing about it that you have to go through it all. To see if you can identify any adults in the pictures to try and get them busted. Freaking sick. And if a child is identified the parents and child have to go through every photo and confirm it. It's horrible. A friend of mine's dad is a cop. He told the story of one time he was called to investigate a fire that was lit in an alleyway. This was midday, he'd yet to eat lunch and had skipped breakfast, and upon arriving to the scene noticed a particularly appetizing aroma coming from the fire. His mouth was involuntarily watering. Turns out, the fire was an ignited carpet, rolled up, with a dead person inside of it. I'm not a cop. But a good friend of mine is and he recently told me a story. A few weeks ago he got a call to a homicide. A 25 year old male had killed a 63 year old male. The victim was a father to a 17 year old high school girl. The girl had recently began dating a known thug drug dealer. The girl's parents had tried to tell her she couldn't date him, but she did it anyways as an act of rebellion. Long story short. The guy stabbed the father about 30 times with a chef's knife found in the owner's kitchen after an argument ensued. The argument was over him not dating his daughter. Looks like dad was right. When my buddy, the cop, showed up he said the whole kitchen was literally covered in the man's blood. He said the corpse looked like a sliced cow carcass. Both the girl and her mother were sitting in their dad husband's blood crying hysterically. And this, kids, is why you listen to your parents. My stepfather worked traffic homicide for years, and encountered any number of frankly gruesome things, but the story I remember really sticking out in my mind involved a car hitting electric pole on a rainy night. The car's occupant had, in the course of the accident, become decapitated, had sheared completely off. The electric pole was severely damaged, one of the lines breaking and falling down to rest in a puddle, which now also contained the severed head. The electrical charge was, apparently, causing the head to bounce and sizzle in a very disconcerting fashion, to put it lightly. Not completely what OP is looking for, but a horrible scene nonetheless. My grandfather's friend was a truck driver for many years, and on one night while he was driving, 
a car swerved across the median and hit his truck head on, killed everyone inside the car, and to make it worse, they had just crossed into America legally so this small sedan had about 6 more people than it should have held stuffed into hollowed out places, so when he hit the car, a red mist just exploded out, he had people stuck up under the hood of his truck and it was a huge mess, fricked him up for a while, probably fricked up any responding officers too. I had an old co-worker who used to drive the 18 wheeler for our company and had a man commit suicide by walking out in front of his truck. He could no longer drive or ride in a vehicle after that, would ride his bike or walk to work. I hope your grandfather's friend ended up being somewhat okay after. I'm sure it's hard to come back from that. I once went to a scene where her ex-boyfriend show up at the house where the girl lived. He knocked and then started firing a shotgun through the door, hitting a toddler. He then went in and shot the girl's mother, I still remember chunks of flesh and underarm hair stuck to the wall, shot the father and then left. The girl was out for the evening. He then left the gun and a suicide knot at the top of a bridge. He went on the run instead of killing himself and was captured shortly thereafter by the marshals. Fricked up scene. My father-in-law is a retired state trooper. He was called to respond to the two vehicle accident near his home. That's where he spent his final minutes with his wife before she died trapped in her vehicle. A bunch come to mind, hard to rank them because they are all so unique. One was a 95 year old lady who lived alone and stopped answering phone calls from her son. He went to her house and found her about a week later. She died while in the bathtub. Her head was resting on the edge of the tub, looking up, with her mouth extremely wide open. She had hundreds of bugs pouring out of her eyes, nose and mouth. It was straight out of a horror movie, you could smell it from the front porch. I felt really bad for her son. No one should ever have to see their mother like that. Posting on the behalf of my friend sitting next to me. Worst crime scene I've been to was 6 month year old baby being thrown out a 6 story window because the mother believed she was possessed by the devil. This is a story I got from the local police lieutenant during an interview for a college paper. It was Halloween night, and my campus has a somewhat notorious Halloween party throughout town. Police actually walk the streets in riot gear that night, and normally get a lot of nice costumes, dudes, anyway. They get a call to break up a fight at a house party. They arrive and are trying to push through all the drunk people to find who's actually fighting. They got to the fight, which was actually taking place the next house over on the sidewalk, but a second too late. They watched as one kid pushed the other in front of a speeding tow truck, basically causing this kid's body to explode into a bloody mess. I think the kid who pushed him got involuntary manslaughter or something like that. Attended scene autopsy of a 13 year old who was hunting with his 11 year old brother and accidentally shot him dead center in the back of the head with a slug meant for deer. The kid looked bad enough when I got there and had already expired, his face looked like a fassa hugger if you want context. Feel really really bad for the brother as he attempted to do CPR and stuff. Obviously in a panic as his brother was likely just expelling blood everywhere and not actually still alive. This poor kid will not only remember shooting his little brother but actually seeing the aftermath and putting his face on it. Obviously far worse for the kid than anyone else. This one's a bit of a cliche, and not really a crime scene. Few months old DOA, elderly women with no family, just two dogs. Family out of state asked for us to check on her, got into her apartment. She had been dead a few months, other than the smell, the sight of her eaten off fingers, by the starving dogs that were there. I'm going to guess you mean a cliche, a clique is a group of people, tragic. Though, old folks living alone seems to not be a good idea. Cop friend of mine was first on the scene to the monkey ripping that woman's face off in CT. He had serious PTSD after that. I work at a police department reviewing old cases. I'd say the worst I've ever come across, so far, was an older man who was found dead in his home by his son. Doesn't sound too bad at first, until you see realize that he was found kneeling next to his bed pants around his knees, playboy on the bed in front of him, and dong still in his hand. Dead two days and found by his son mid fap. Actually you would be amazed by how many corpses are found photographed partially or fully naked. A lot of them are found in the bathroom with their pants down, 
collapsed onto the floor with poop in the toilet on the floor on the person. I'd say 80% of our untimelies are found partially naked with poop somewhere nearby. Currently just a volunteer, but hoping to hold the official title and role soon. A few months back there was a call out to someone who had jumped in front of a train. Fairly certain it was done purposefully, but no one knows for sure, and I haven't followed up on it. Lady had her legs severed, and her stomach area was caved inwards. Sort of like in those cartoons where their stomachs are flat against the road after being run over. But with more intestines and stuff that had burst out of various exit points from the pressure. Was given the option to go home for the day after that. But decided to stay. Some guy later in the day called us. Good for nothing pigs. Which made me realize how quick people are to judge us. Without even knowing what we do or have to deal with. Was very new to it at this point. Not a good day. Not me by my police trade school teacher told me a story of such a fricked up crime scene he was a part of. There was this beautiful woman could have been a model. And she was naked in the floor of her hotel room her head not attached to her body and blood everywhere. The entire hotel was a crime scene and my teacher kept seeing cops sneak in to see the hot dead chick and my teacher who had command was furious. He kicked them all out and tried to do his job. Until his higher up. I think a lieutenant. Came in by asking around I heard the hot headless chick was here. Since he was a higher rank the second he stepped in he took command of the scene and my teacher never did find out what happened except some cops care about seeing a hot corpse than doing their job. I'm pretty sure being headless takes a corpse from hot to not. The Icicle Man. Outside of smaller city in Idaho, Pop. 27k, is a kind of shanty town affectionately known as welfare. The only business is a little convenience store a lady runs out of her house. Welfare, it has at least a 90% unemployment rate. Anyways, it's the dead of winter and around minus 20 degrees F. Get a call about a missing persons. A man of 70 hasn't been seen or heard from in over month. Get at his trailer home and come across the following scene. Man's gas had been shut off due to lack of payment but electricity was still on. Man had water bed with an electric heater to warm the water. Looks like man had been stabbed on the bed. He rotted down to essentially a soup like consistency. His liquefied remains had dribbled off the edge of the heated water bed to form intricate icicles off the edge. The icicle man was the absolute worst. My dad used to work the... He told me about how they figured out the cartels used to use stillborns and orphans to traffic drugs. They would kill the kids and preserve them so that they could stitch C and H inside their bodies. They would hand the stuffed kids off to a girl that looked like a mom and they would pretend their kid was sleeping when they were crossing a border. Went on for years until a drug dog attacked one of the stuffed infants and sees snowed everywhere. I was on vacation in Tokyo a long time ago. Strolling through the streets one day I came to a train crossing and several pedestrians stopped as the train approached. One guy, a mid-50s salaryman in a cheap suit, turned to me, put his finger over his lips and said SHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHH
she was ordered to remain with him until he arrived at the hospital and to stay with him until the coroner arrived, because though he was still alive when she arrived, it was clear that he wasn't going to make it, and she needed to do continuity on the body. She said when they performed the autopsy, the only part of his body that hadn't sustained second or third degree burns were the bottoms of his feet. My colleague says the hardest this she has ever done was traveling to the hospital with him, and listen to him beg to see his parents again, as they both knew he was going to die. I'm not a cop, but I accidentally ran into a crime scene once. My neighbors down the street had always been pretty strange. It was some super aloof grandparents, their seriously messed up daughter who is rarely around, and their daughter's daughter about 3 years younger than me who I always babysat, for free usually because they were pretty poor. Anyway one day me and the girl are coming home from school, she's probably 9 and I was around 12. Her mom is bipolar with psychosis, probably on the schizo effective end and has been dating around with guys not much better. I leave for my house and she walks into this apartment, and then a minute later there's a gunshot. Everyone around starts going for the complex including my parents to investigate, and me following along a few minutes after. I got a small glimpse, there was a ton of chaos. The police had been called, the girl is screaming from inside the apartment, my parents are trying to block me from seeing of blood and brains all over the wall. I found out later that apparently her mom's boyfriend was waiting at the table with a handgun and blew his brains out when she walked in, in front of her and her mom. I saw her like once after that but the kid was totally messed up from abuse and the trauma. I don't envy the officers who had to talk to them and check out the scene. My dad was a copper in Manchester, UK, so he and his probationer partner, probationer means an officer being trained, get a call to a missing and concerned for welfare in an old people's gated community. It's July, and pretty warm. The old guy hadn't been seen for about 5 weeks. My dad kicks the door into the house and is hit by, what he calls, a wall of rotting corpse smell. The probationer officer asks to go in, and my dad says it's not something you need to see at this stage in your training. Ignoring his advice she walks in and instantly throws up. The corpse has turned black, tongue swirl and all this crap. The coroner comes round and they start to lift the body off of the bed. Upon lifting the corpse the back skin falls off and the kidneys drop out onto the bed. My dad threw up on the body and the coroner apparently laughs. Of 9 years of service that was the worst thing he ever saw. When my father was a rookie, almost 60 years ago, he was called to a trailer park by concerned neighbors. It was winter and a poor family had tried to heat their trailer with the kitchen oven. The snow from the roof melted, iced over the windows and effectively sealed it. When my father and his partner forced the door they found the bodies of young children and the father. The mother was no longer rational from the effects of CO2. She was on her hands and knees in the kitchen, trying to scrub the vomit of her dead children off the floor with their bodies scattered around her. Pop saw World War II from Normandy Beach to Berlin. I asked him what was the worst thing he had seen while in uniform. I was not expecting a story about a NJ trailer park. My anatomy professor worked in ANA for a while. I'm not sure in what capacity. He wasn't a medical doctor or nurse. But one morning he was working and this guy walks in. Torn clothes and covered in dirt and blood. With his shirt full of something squidgy and leaves. Holding the edges to keep everything contained. Like when little kids use shirts to carry legos. The guy drove himself to the hospital. But he is disoriented and isn't making any sense. But they quickly realize his intestines are in his shirt. Well, partly in his shirt and partly in him. They get him in surgery and clean up what they can. Stuffing it back in, but some of it gets removed because it's too damaged or dirty or whatever. Turns out he was out hunting early in the morning by himself. He had climbed a tree to get away. Hunting platform or something. I don't remember what it was called and I don't hunt. Sorry. The steps up to the platform were mounted into the tree. Not a ladder but sort of metal L shapes designed to hold a foot and keep it from slipping off. Except at some point he did slip off, and he caught himself on the hook step with his belly. He hit the ground, lay there for a bit, and then realized his insides were trying to be outsides. So he scooped them up as best he could and made his way to his car, where he drove himself to the air. Not sure if it was the worst, but definitely the most gratifying once I found out the details as to what happened. Went to a house for a call of a dog loose. Upon entering the house it looked like a slasher film. 
blood smeared all over the walls, looks like large arterial squirts all over the place on the ceiling, etc. The homeowner had towels wrapped around his leg and arms and was at the point of passing out. All the while a happy pitbull covered in blood was outside looking at me wagging his tail. Got the guy medical attention and retrieved the dog. Turns out the homeowner was beating his dog trying to get it to become fight worthy. Dog turned around and made the homeowner his bee. Sad that the dog was put down. Dog seemed like it could have been a great dog if it was given a proper chance in a loving home. My stepdad was a lieutenant defective in our midwestern town of about 25,000 people. He was in charge of this case where a serial killer stopped on his way through down to tie up, violate and gut a 16 year old girl in her own bed after school. My stepdad stayed in the bedroom with her body through all the forensics and evidence collection. He had teenage kids of his own at the time. The killer went on to Florida to do the same thing to a 14 year old girl. This was in the 80s so it took some time before they were able to connect the two cases. Eventually the killer was caught after shooting a police officer in Texas. He was given the death penalty. This was the biggest case of my stepdad's life. He has stayed in touch with the girl's family over the last 30 years. Just a few months ago the case was on one of those criminal investigation shows where they interviewed my stepdad. He went back to the police station. He's been retired for 20 years and had to go through all the old documents and photos. Even after all this time, he still came home teary-eyed and exhausted. My dad told me about a scene he had to go out to once. This guy lives with his wife and her mother-in-law and his son. The husband and wife were into prescription pills and had a bad habit. One day the mother went to pick the son from school and the father and his mill got into it. He grabbed his rifle, shot her then went outside into the woods into a stand with a clear view of the house. He called his wife and told her what he did. When the wife pulled up, she ran inside and then ran back out. She must have seen her husband from afar and told her son to get down. As soon as she did, her husband took the top of her head off walked up to the car and fired a couple more rounds into it. He then shot himself in the head and the son witnessed it all. Years back my criminal justice professor told me the worst two he's been to a guy had been pinned in between the platform and a train after accidentally slipping. They had to call the family to the scene because the only thing holding him together was the train. Once the train was moved he would die. He had to watch them say their goodbyes. Then there was an escalator incident where a little girl's arm was sucked into the escalator halfway. He said the screams alone were horrifying and then when they removed her from the escalator she had no meat left on the bone below the elbow. Ugh the train is horrible but I think it's the escalator that gets me. This just confirms my fear of escalators isn't that irrational. My husband is an MP. Some parents came home with their baby in the car seat and decided the best place to put the baby in the car seat is on the stove. When they walked by the stove turned on and the car seat caught in fire. They didn't know till the baby was screaming. When my husband got there the car seat was an unrecognizable melted plastic blob in the middle of the road. Another time a teenage son beat a mother with a curtain shower rod with the curtain still attached. Then he locked her in a dog cage. My criminal justice professor told me this one. His co-worker followed a man who was suspected of kidnapping a little boy into his home. The co-worker makes his way into the man's bedroom where he finds him fricking the said little boy with a gun pointed at the back of his head. The man looks at the officer and grins as he pulls the trigger killing the little boy. Only solace I took in it was that the officer shot him almost immediately after. Not a cop, but saw the helmet with the visor closed on the highway. Perfectly sitting on the road. 100 meters after the helmet is a motorcycle. Another 50 meters down the road lies the rest of the body completely intact except for the head. I thought WTF no head how turns out the motorcycle driver crashed in such a way that his head got stuck between two steel lines on the side of the road and it came right off his shoulders. His head was still in the helmet. I had looked at the helmet for a good 15 seconds thinking whether I should pick it up at first. I had no idea that his head was still in there. So glad I didn't. I haven't driven anything with two wheels at high speeds after that. Serious, those of you who worked undercover, what is the most taboo thing you witnessed, but could not intervene as to not blow your cover? When I worked QA for a video game publisher, they had me work an E3 as a secret player. Basically I got to play new games for that publisher and act like they were amazing in front of press. While I was taking a break I saw one of the producers hooking up with a booth babe. 
He didn't recognize me, but I knew he was married and had a kid on the way. I didn't say crap. He got laid off when the rest of us did about a year later. But that's just kinda how E3 goes. Couple showed up to a party with their kids, boy about 11, girl around 9, get paid by host, have kids do it with each other for entertainment of some of the people present. For further tips let a couple sick us join in after a few minutes. Kids have been safely wards of the state for several years now for your information. I wasn't exactly undercover, but there was a degree of subterfuge involved. When I was working in the customer service department of a health insurance company, I had a call one day that was just a little off. The guy was calling from a pharmacy about a problem with his prescription. That was the normal part. The red flag was his demeanor. He was agitated, as anyone would be in that situation, but he was being overly polite. Normally in this situation, even a very tolerant person would still have some choice words for his insurance carrier. Not this guy. Everything was yes. Sir and if it wouldn't be too much trouble, sir, it just didn't quite fit. To better assist him, I asked him what prescription he was trying to fill, the dosage, and the quantity. He was getting oxy, maximum quantity, maximum dosage. The plot thickens. So I asked him to hold while I checked with our pharmacy vendor to see if they could shed some light on the issue. What I was actually doing was having my team led research the guy. It took a while. So I had to keep coming back to the call to ask the guy if he wouldn't mind waiting just a little longer. That's not a problem at all, sir. I don't mind waiting one bit. At this point, he was starting to sound anxious. Still very polite. What my team led found was that the guy was getting prescriptions for basically every narcotic under the sun filled at different pharmacies all over town. And so was his wife. Maximum dosage. Maximum quantity. The reason he couldn't get this particular prescription filled is because our pharmacy vendor flagged his policy and it was under review. That flag had just been placed that very morning, but they hadn't had a chance to take any action just yet. By this point, I've got my team led on the phone with the pharmacy vendor, my supervisor on the phone with our internal fraud investigators, and my manager on the phone with an Leo in the guy's jurisdiction. Just before the call ended, I heard the cop walk up next to him, address him by his full name, and tell him to hang up the phone. He and his wife got dinged for numerous counts of distribution and insurance fraud. The director of our fraud unit invited me to her office to thank me for being proactive. She also talked to me about going to school to become a fraud investigator. That director is now a VP, and I still get a high five from her when I pass her in the halls. A few years back we got a tip that a guy who owned an advertising agency in the area and was also running funding a rim lab. We got a his assistant who was hilariously into to the whole thing. I'm guessing many years of verbal abuse from a dickhead will fan the flame of revenge. We would be alerted when he left the office each day where he'd pick his two daughters up from a fancy catholic school and sometimes swing by what we eventually confirmed was the lab. They would wait in the car while he was inside for about an hour. Occasionally the daughters would leave the car and go somewhere. We assumed in the beginning that it was to get something to eat as they often came back with a bag of food. But there was a McDonald's a block over and this was a nice white paper bag. Not a plastic one from a convenience store. A small thing but it just seemed odd. One day they were followed and it out they were friends with the daughter of another guy who owned a restaurant and worked as the hostess. Apparently she figured out that that. Surprise. Well do men will pay good money to frick young pretty girls. The two sisters girls would wait behind the building then the hostess would come out with 3-5 guys usually in suits and take everyone down to the basement of another building restaurant guy used for storage. When they came out the guys went directly to their cars or walked to the train. The girls would go inside the restaurant and come out with that white paper bag. We busted M guy eventually but the girls business wasn't our problem. My partner reported it and eventually someone followed up. Through casual conversation rumors I've heard they made $300 per guy and the whole thing had been going on for 7 months. Supposedly it was the youngest of the two sisters who had an IQ off the chart and masterminded the entire operation. Neither father had any idea what was going on and the girls were between 12 and 15. As I was strictly involved with observation evidence gathering on M man. The girls business was handled elsewhere and due to their ages the case files are sealed well above my pay grade. One day though, it will be a fascinating read.
Supposedly it was the youngest of the two sisters who had an IQ off the chart and masterminded the entire operation. I bet you she and her sister were physically shamed before this happened. Kids don't come up with perverted crap like this on their own. From 2007 through 2008 I worked on a smuggling interdiction task force. My team dealt with human trafficking. My job was all balls and I regret that we couldn't really do anything to put a dent in the problem. I worked under covering that I did not wear a uniform or carry a badge and my authority was civilian so I only reported to LEAs. The most taboo thing I witnessed that I was not allowed to do anything about was women, mothers, aunts, grandmothers, offering children for sex in exchange for cash. The truth of the matter is, that, at least in western society, the threshold of evidence required to hold women responsible for sex trafficking is not even in the same ballpark as for men. The number of cases we had to tolerate sickens me. I don't know which we need to address first as a society, the rampant abuse or the gender bias that keeps it going. But the truth be told, I met just as many women pimps and abusers as I did men. The biggest difference I could see is that women were more often pimping out the under 12 demographic versus the male pimps that were pimping out the teens. I never saw one female prosecuted, but we were successful in moving a handful of kids to foster care. Working as a pie, without giving too many details, I was a part of a drug happy orgy a pair of unfit parents set up. Had my partner do the drugs off camera with the excuse of me having a drug test for my job so I couldn't partake in that. 10 plus people there, mostly in couples, and I ended up screwing the unfit mother and recorded her getting sandwiched at her home and plenty of other things. Needless to say, the kids aren't in that house anymore. Ended up quitting after that job. Kinda fricked with my head. The money was kind of ridiculous at times though. It was a custody case. The children went with their bio father who had been fighting for them for a long time. I've had to do some forensic PC work. Scene. Bodies mishandled by funeral staff. Psychologists molesting their patients. Veterinarians torturing animals. Dentists killing children with unnecessary anesthesia. Doctors filling a man's chest with metal stints for no reason. Older doctors that are clearly incompetent cutting up some poor guy indiscriminately. I know I see the worst of the worst, but it is enough to make me not want to go to a medical professional until I absolutely have to. Even then it is iffy. All of these cases have the full attention of legal authorities. All of them took place several years ago. Anyone who could be charged has been charged. Worked as a private investigator for a while. Mostly did work comp cases. Seen some shiftiness. Drug deals. ETC. Worst thing. Was conducting surveillance on a person at an apartment complex. Get there before light to set up my rig. Little bit before sunrise this Mexican couple. 50s ish. In a truck pull up in front of my position. Guys pulling a trailer. Gets out rummage through dumpster for metal and stuff. Okay. Not so bad. Then the woman with him. Gets out and between my vehicle and said dumpster proceeds to pop a squat and crap on the ground. Way to start my morning guys. Thanks. She's just getting swifty. I was working a detail a few years back in the parks district of our county. We've had complaints and issues with men engaged in carnal activity in vehicles and restrooms. I volunteered to be a decoy with a wire to see if the issue was out of hand. I was hanging out in my vehicle and decided to go near the men's restroom for a bit. It wasn't long when a vehicle with out of county plates parked, an elderly gentleman driving. I kept my position at the restroom entrance when he walked up, I could tell he wasn't there to use the restroom. He chose the first stall and acted as if he had to urinate, then I heard it. He was masturbating pretty vigorously and the sound was awful. He leaned back out of the stall to see if I was still there. I wanted to get the heck out of there. The look on his face, licking his lips with drool running down his chin. I'm not quite clear of the conversation but he either finished or lost interest. As he was walking out of the restroom he reached out and grabbed my twig and berries. I froze, was shocked and didn't know what to do from there. My partners were in an enclosed garage watching and listening to the entire thing. After running this guy's information, it came back the car belonged to a diocese out of Dayton, Ohio and the elderly male was the priest. I never volunteered for that crap again. This is kinda boring but I was told to join a specific gang in college to leak info about it so that they could be removed from college. Kids of rich peeps, 
It turns out they used to regularly frick teen girls, sometimes even as young as 12, and used to give them drugs instead of money so that the girls would come around for more. I thought it was quite serious so I gave all this information when I was about to pass out. My college is now closed for one year for suspected drug distribution. I worked for a large retailer doing internal loss prevention. I'm not the same guy that follows shoplifters around a store. I investigated the actual employees including managers and warehousing employees and their supervisors. I would enter the store as a new hire or a transfer. A common issue was items missing from the loading dock. Most of the time it was employees stealing things and selling it out the back door. In one town in Iowa I had to befriend a guy who was stealing a large amount of electronics. He just had a kid and stuff so it was a bit hard. He asked if I wanted in. I'm not going to say he why he was doing it but it resulted in him removing surveillance to enter the electronics room and steal iPods and stuff. He was caught with the surveillance equipment in his car. Meanwhile, he was a store loss prevention guy that followed around shoplifters. By paying him, he would intentionally place himself at the opposite end of a store while someone would come in and leave with an abnormal amount of small resellables. Another was to inspect groups or theft rings. People who steal specific things from several stores in an area for resale. We would then often find these items for sale online. The 60 day world of Warcraft cards were a big one. Shaving razor blades, PC games, DVDs were an issue until they completely lost their value, and cosmetics. One time I had to follow a guy around for a week while he placed UPC labels for low value items on expensive items. He printed the UPC labels at home and put them on specific items. An accomplice, a shopper, would then find that exact item, pay at the register like normal with about $50 in random items at peak hours. This went on for about 2 years. This guy had over 700k in sales on his ebay account for a 2 year time period. Turns out he was doing this at 6 stores with 6 employees. Truth is though, these 7 people weren't even a drop in a bucket in regards to shrinkage. More like a drop in a well. 25 years ago, give or take, I did some work as a private investigator. Someone I knew did it as a side job out of a large law firm's office, and he hired me to help him out. Lots of interviewing witnesses to something that may have happened several years ago and stuff like that. One night I had to drive about 45 minutes out into the country to interview someone involved in a possible DUI incident where he ran a stop sign and severely injured someone. I posed as someone from his law office, and never let on that I was working for the victims. I thought myself pretty sneaky for doing that. As we're sitting there and I'm asking some roundabout questions hoping not to tip him off. He just goes and tells the whole story of how drunk he was, how much he had been drinking, where he had been drinking and tons of other details. As I'm listening to this I'm thinking that if he finds out I'm from the other side of the case, he could kill me pretty easily. I quickly ended the interview, drove a couple towns over and wrote down everything he said in more details and turned it into the lawyers the next day. Tried to answer some questions below. This was late 1980s, I had zero training was probably 20 years old, had no knowledge of anything law related etc. I have no idea if what I learned was ever used, or even given to the attorneys. It could have been that the pie who I was helping out said what everyone here has said and just never told the law firm about it. I have no idea. After realizing how stupid it was of me to be out doing this, alone, with no one knowing where I was or what I was doing, and the fact that no one had given me any sort of training or guidance. I never went back to the office again and instead just focused on trying to build my freelance photography career. Pi here, was in a crappy neighborhood and saw a guy beat his girlfriend pretty badly, made an anonymous tip to the police but they got there way too late and the GF ended up going back to the guy anyway. I watched an 8 year old boy get punched in the face by his mother who was about to sell me an ounce of MJ. We waited as long as we could to not burn the CI, then locked her up on both charges even though I wanted to bash her face and right there. Not anywhere near cop or spy level, but was once hired by a music retailer to see how much attention his staff were paying to theft. By sharplifting his store, while legally ripping off the store, I saw a guy I knew watching me, and clearly encouraged by my blatant behavior, he proceeded to do the same. 
I don't know if this counts but when I was in high school over 15 years ago I worked at a KFC. The manager wanted me to keep an eye out on workers and report back to her. She wanted to know who was stealing boxes of stuff, potato and gravy, chicken salt etc. She conveyed that my actions would be looked upon very favorably and perhaps even led to a better position eventually like management if I acted a spy. I told the guy who was doing it that I was meant to be a spy. He thanked me and gave me 5 big bags of chicken salt, heaps of coleslaw and potato and gravy. I got so sick of that crap so quick that I gave most of it away to my relatives. I lived in a pretty poor working class area, so did my relatives, so they were stoked cause they loved KFC. I don't think she found out what we did so I guess I didn't blow my cover as a double agent. I used a training at a call center. I always included being aware of social engineering attempts in my role plays. Management liked this so much they started having me do this as a secret caller. I hate to say but I got a lot more people than I should have. Even started doing it ad hoc for other divisions when word got round. Wast was an agent that I'm not sure if she really just didn't care or was just so overly helpful she didn't think twice. But man I could have stolen 3 or 4 people identities if I was actually running a scam. This looks like something subreddit simulator would say. I finally have won. I was JTF6 and we covertly patrolled for drug harvesting activity aka drug plots. My partner and I had eyes on this one location. We had to observe them for a period of time to generate a decent salute report. We see this wild butt road warrior Rudla looking kid come hauling butt up on his dirt bike with who we thought was his mom or grandma. Then we witness some incestuous or at the very least underage relations by the feral kid and the she beast he brought with him. The whole time we're just sitting there in our hide grossed out and unable to move or intervene or we'd blow our cover and the whole op didn't really care to intervene on this, but I was happy to include it in my report. I'm a mystery shopper and the manager say these two really attractive models at prime seats by the bar. Throughout the meal he went behind the bar to make them drinks without ringing them up, took pictures with them, and was overall really obnoxious. I think he even got their phone number. They were obviously using him for free stuff. For this class of restaurant I am supposed to identify the manager and see them make contact with 3 or more tables. All drinks and definitely supposed to be rung through the pose. I was happy to put this in my report. I live in Miami, though, and I see this crap happen regularly. The rest of the people get treated like this. Another, I got my oil changed and the guy calmed me on it. I felt bad and didn't want to get the guy in trouble so I took the hit in the system for not turning in a report. I guess I'm as bad as the girls. I was having a really bad week and I guess he could see that. One last. My boyfriend and I do the mystery dinners and we normally go to fairly expensive restaurants. We're in our mid-twenties and stand out as fairly young and not as wealthy compared to the rest of the crowd. We usually get service that is watered down when you can hear the red carpet being rolled out to the older couple next to you. What is funny is that we will tip better than a lot of those people as most of our friends are in the service industry and we know how it goes. But treat us poorly and we tip poorly. I know how I should be treated when I'm paying $100 head. Not too big of a deal. But watched a guy get jumped a couple days ago by 4 teenagers. Took his bag of booze, wallet and beat him for a few seconds before rising their bikes away. Entire incident was less than 30 seconds. I was working UC as a Leo. I worked as an undercover operative for a private investigation firm. I don't think I saw anything taboo. I said, but there was definitely some stuff going on that was notable. I was once placed at a soft drink bottling facility on the graveyard shift as a mechanic. My job was to keep the motors lubed on all the conveyor belt systems and so forth. I knew nothing at all about that line of work but the pie firm got me into the union job using false records and a little string pulling by the plant president. My official job was to look for employee frick ups. There were plenty. Drinking on the job was the main frick up. Friday nights, especially, out back of the loading docks is where we kept the wooden pallets. Hundreds of them stacked in about 20 foot high columns. Friday nights we'd take the forklifts and create a hidden pathway in the middle of the stacks where we'd sneak a nice chests full of beer. Throughout the night, we'd shuttle people in and out of the hidden area so they could drink. Forklift them in and circle back a few minutes later with a new crew to drop off while returning the imbibe back to their stations. Night boss had no idea. 
He was usually passed out drunk in his office. Oh. I finally had to have a clandestine meeting with the plant president to let him know that. Due to my ignorance on what my phony job actually entailed. He better get somebody in there to lube those machines before crap started breaking down. I was placed at a winery once. Hardest work I've ever done. The owner's son ended up being the biggest M dealer in the area, running the whole operation from the winery. I was once also placed in an office setting for a sweepstakes company. There wasn't much going on there. Pretty boring. However, I did end up in a threesome with the boss's secretary and her friend, so there's that. Sounds like you. Puts on sunglasses. Won the lottery with that last one. I work in compliance for factories in Asia. The main focus of my job is to make sure the factories are following rules set by who contacts them to make something. I let a group of about 30 work over time after they all stood outside my office asking why I am not allowing them to make more money before the upcoming holiday. Redditors who are in law enforcement. What's the most extreme form of vigilantism you've seen? Serious. We have a lot of pedophile hunters lure predators to near our station. To be honest they cause more trouble than a lot of the jobs are worth. They rarely give statements, their evidence is lacking and once they organize the interception they disappear as quick as they appeared meaning often the case is threadbare. After actually speaking with them somewhat, they are getting better at giving statements and providing the evidence they've gathered. Any idiot that agrees to meet a 12 year old at a weather spoons on a railway station deserves to be intercepted by us IMHO. In my town there used to be this group of punk thugs that hanged near a J.I. Jitsu gym. The fighters never stood up for themselves since they couldn't know whether or not the thugs were armed. Until one day they beat a guy up somewhat seriously. The next day the fighters got together and hatched a plan. One of them had a contact in the police, so a random search happened to apprehend any guns the punks might have. They didn't have any. Couple minutes later the whole J.I. Jitsu Academy comes up and beats the living crap out of them. The thugs decided to find another place to hang in. As a BJJ practitioner, this pleases me. 1974 to 1975 ish. When I was little, about 5, my second oldest sister was married to this cockbag. They were splitting up and she moved back home with my toddler nephew. Her soon to be ex would call the house and make threats to her and about my nephew. She hadn't told my parents about this. One day, he called and my dad picked up 3 second phone at the same time my sister picked up. He heard the STBX threaten to kill my sister and nephew and to take me away until I grew up to take her place. Dad quietly told mom to tell sis that STBX needed to come over so they could talk about their marriage. Guy shows up. My dad answers and he beat that man almost dead. Neighbors called the cops and pulled my dad off while he was pounding the guy's head into the sidewalk. Dad fell in a trash bag that had a broken window pane in it. Guy had half a face left and his skull was cracked. Survived but in a mental institution for the rest of his life. Dad had to drop his drawers in front of the neighborhood to get the hide chunk removed from his butt. Mom was still trying to get to the guy while they were loading him in the ambulance. Dad pulled out his driver's license, military card, retired air force, Korean war, army intelligence, early years of Vietnam, and his assistant fire chief badge, was working at the local air force base, the one in Colorado with the jolly green giants golf balls. Dad was not put in handcuffs but was taken into CTGE prosecutor, they looked at dad's credentials, tried to pull house military file, couldn't, not high enough security clearance, listened to my dad's version of what happened, and had one of the detectives take my dad back home, he was gone for like 4 hours, that was his punishment, well, that and the scar on his butt, your dad is into some deep military crap, judge prosecutor knows better and believed your dad 100% at an instant rather than jumping through the judicial system hoopla and possibly tarnish his rep by being responsible for convicting an army veteran by doing what's arguably right, a kudos to the judge prosecutor, and especially your dad. My uncle is a cop and there is a guy in Philly who does what he calls freelance investigation, the problem is he is a bit of a crackpot so he lost his actual job. He's given them great information such as a 50 page report connecting a drug dealer in Camden to a series of muggings in Kensington and some other parts of North Philly because the guy visited his mother and sister at their house every Friday to Saturday which was when the muggings took place. But he crashed at a friend's in Camden Sunday to Thursday. 
He even included photos of the guy including a three surveillance videos putting the guy within two blocks of three different muggings. This dude followed this guy off and on for like seven months and led to an arrest and conviction and got a cash award. On the other hand he also believes that a 60 some year old woman from Chinatown who died in the mid 2000s in a solved murder actually faked her own death and runs a drug ring all because she had a drug conviction in the 70s for being caught with some dope outside a concert. His logic basically goes she was shot in her face to hide her identity. She has a history of drug crimes. Look this other Asian woman at the market looks like how she did but aged another 10 years. I followed this woman. She lives within 9 blocks of where she used to before she faked her death. Her husband is in on it because they both. Picture of a totally different Asian woman than the first provided. Went to Ikea on the same day and talked in pa. <laughs> Go make an arrest. Something that outrageous has to be true. I've made this comment before of a story my dad told me. My dad was chasing a guy down a highway that was backed up with traffic on foot. A guy with his family in the car dressed like they were on their way to church opened his car door just as the guy my dad was chasing was running by knocking him to the ground. My dad, the guy he was handcuffing, and the guy who opened the door were all laughing at what had just occurred. That scene made me crack up. Even the guy running from the cop was like lol fml. I'm a criminal defense attorney. Know a case where a widely known murderer threatened to kill his neighbors. The uncle of one of them heard. Left straight from a funeral. Walked up and shot him in the chest. Ended up being found not guilty too. Most gangster thing I've ever heard. CJ student. And pursing a career in corrections. When we were going over hospice in class. Inmates dying. And get treated with care by others till you suffering. We learned about a man nicknamed PVT Jack. He served in World War II. And received plenty of honors. His son got addicted to H and hung himself. Jack killed the drug dealer, and was arrested for first degree murder and sentenced to life. He was a POW in World War II, and was experienced with being locked up for most of his life at this point when he was submitted to hospice. Just watching the man acting tough while dying in that bed being surrounded with pictures of family was awful. It makes you realize how the people in prison aren't all bad people, they just make mistakes. There was a documentary on it which we watched and covered him several times as examples of not considering the people in prison as lesser than you for being there. A friend of mine told me about a case that his wife prosecuted. 70 year old woman walks in on her 71 year old husband who is blowing her grandson. His step grandson. Kid is about 12 years old. She walks to another room in the house. Gets a gun. And shoots her husband once. He survives the first shot and drags himself outside onto their porch. She shoots him again in the back, killing him. The jury deadlocks on the first two trials, resulting in mistrials. On the third trial she is convicted of manslaughter and given 30 days in jail. I bet she had bigger balls than her husband. I worked in a small midwestern town nearly 20 years ago. Received a disturbance call and found a heavy set 50ish white man laying in his front yard half conscious. He was obliviously involved in a fight. Smelled of gas and had burns on his legs. He was probably in shock, heavy drunk, most likely both, and refused to answer any of my questions. My partner and the guy's family arrived just as he refused medical service. It was only at this point could we get a positive ID. Since he was refusing to talk, except to say no ambulance, the female relative was concerned, while another male relative did volunteer that that his uncle had just been released from prison for child molestation. The neighbors saw nothing. The victim refused to make a statement. Not much to be done. The guy was extremely lucky that we wasn't burned to a crisp. I worked for two more years afterward and there were no further attacks involving this guy. Immigration law here. Lost count the number of times a cheating BFGF has been dobbed in by their ex. You always know those ones are good. Lots of detail and always manage to get the target as the info is very specific. Used to work in a people trafficking team. Targets were mostly the sex massage industry. Legal here. But workers are occasionally trafficked and often in the country unlawfully. Had one high end brothel who played by the rules dobbin on all the dodgy ones. Worked well for him as we were pushing business his way. We would still do compliance checks on him. But we never had an issue. Another memorable one. 
Had a family keeping an Indian girl as a slave housekeeper. We got her out of that crap and into a woman's refuge and get her a visa. Settled in the country etc. Later. During the court case, we find out that she had been raped by the father and adult son of the house. She wouldn't take it further out if shame and the public prosecutor wouldn't proceed as she wouldn't give evidence. About a year later rescued girl's family come to visit her. Her dad sets fire to this family's house less than an hour after being in the country. I think this is my favorite one. Travels halfway around the world just to burn those M house down. Shortly after my grandfather came home to small town western Kansas after World War II a young girl was raped or murdered. He's since passed and I don't remember this part exactly, but something terrible happened to a young girl and he, with the townspeople, knew who done it, while waiting for law enforcement to arrive, which in that part of the world could take hours at a time, they happened to had found the man, brought him back to town. Wrapped barbed wire around his neck and dragged him through town by horse until he was a lifeless bloody pulp. Drug him through town in front of all to see, yet nobody was ever arrested. I'm sure when the cops finally did arrive nobody saw a thing. Back then, especially in rural counties, the town's going to protect their own. Not law enforcement, but when I was in high school a guy lured his best friend out to a remote field behind a tribal casino a few miles outside of town and beat him to death with a hammer, and subsequently buried him, because his girlfriend told him the best friend had raped her. There were missing person posters all over my high school 4 weeks before they found the body and discovered what had happened, and the guy kept showing up to school the whole time like nothing had happened. I went to a very homogeneous, preppy, safe high school, where things like this simply didn't happen. Turns out the girlfriend had made the whole thing up. I wish she'd share his sentence. We'll add on here as a medic as well. This guy pees someone off. When we found him he was naked in the bushes, shot through his eyeball and it came out around his ear. Trauma doctor said he had multiple broken bones from getting tossed from a moving car, had been kicked and stomped on his stomach and face and to top it off he had been... Not sure what he did to deserve that, but someone got their revenge that night. Mall security, not real law enforcement. Many years ago, I was 18, just started doing security at a small mall, third day on the job. Got a call that someone had just snatched some jewelry that they were looking at, got a vague description, saw someone running through the mall out of the corner of my eye, so I made an assumption and took off running after him. Another shopper pointed me in the right direction as he ran outside. I saw him run into the dumpster storage area of a Burger King that was in our parking lot, so I, being young and full of adrenaline, ran into it too. Found the guy crouched behind a disgusting oils and fats bin. I have no idea how I did it, but I somehow cuffed the guy, with my brand new shiny handcuffs I'd gotten 3 days ago, at which point my colleague finally showed up. Adrenaline and excitement turns you into some kind of superhuman, or the guy was super submissive. We walked him back to the mall and into a service corridor to take him to the security office and wait for the police. We're halfway down the back hallway when the door from the mall bursts open and it's the owner of the jewelry store. This isn't the first time he's been robbed. He walks towards us, calm and collected, and we tell him we caught the guy and the police are on the way. Everything is good. He got a little too close our bad, and then punches the guy in the face, who has his hands cuffed behind his back. The guy drops to the floor. We lose our crap on the store owner, as he's just flicked up our awesome success. We push him away, but he's done what he wanted to do, so he's quite pleased with himself. I call an ambulance, and I still remember very well arguing with the 911 operator because I didn't know the address of the mall. It's xxxxxx center. It's a mall. Everyone knows where it is. Anyway, ambulance shows up, along with the police, and they arrest both of the thief and the store owner. The thief goes to hospital, but he's fine. Few weeks later we find out that everyone dropped the charges against everyone else and life went on for everyone. Very annoying, as I wanted to celebrate my first conviction, but it wasn't to be. I call an ambulance, and I still remember very well arguing with the 911 operator because I didn't know the address of the mall. It's xxxxxx center, it's a mall, everyone knows where it is. Holy freaking crap that is hilarious. I get the operator's point, but dang that is just pure hilarity. 
my great uncle. His home is being robbed and he lives in a small farming village, at the time, and he lives with his elderly mother and sisters. He's 60 so he's the only man of the house. So some armed, knives not guns, burglars try to break in. So what does he do? He takes a bamboo stick with knives lashed on both ends, jumps out the ground floor window, and confronts about 4-7 young 20-30 year olds all armed with knives. He puts enough of a show to scare off all 7 of them. Posted this in another thread, but it fits this one better. Where I grew up several of the county cops were blatantly corrupt. Back around 86 one of the cops was accused of raping an underage girl. Cops wouldn't do anything. One night rapey cop stops answering radio. Next morning his petrol car is found with lights flashing. His uniform is freshly washed, ironed, and folded in the driver's seat. There is also this one family of old farm boys you don't pee off who just happened to have a hog farm on the same road they found the car on. The official story is he resigned and left town. But his brother hasn't heard from him since. Hogs will eat human bodies. Betting the evidence was pooped out by a pig. A civil in here, but here's a little wartime story from Sarajevo. When the Serbs started shelling the city, nobody was spared but a few informants and infiltrators. A while later some of these informanters started being brutally killed and or had their true identities revered by just one guy. Anyways, our wartime government didn't think killing civilians was a good idea so they went out and hunted down this vigilante. All because we wanted to show that we were the good guys. I had a DUI defense attorney, along with several others, box in a DUI driver and force him to pull to the shoulder. The DUI defense attorney then took the guy's keys and waited for me to get there. I jokingly asked the vigilante attorney if he was planning on representing the DUI driver and he responded. Heck no the driver later blew .360 on the breath test, which is over 4 times the legal limit. Goddamn. A .36 is like alcoholic territory. I blew a .24 on my buddies at a party and I was beyond fricked. My other friend's dad was an alcoholic for 40 years and got pulled over at around .30. Said he felt sober and had no problem walking. Just stank of vodka. A week ago in my city two guys broke into a house demanding money. They stabbed three of the residents but then both burglars were stabbed to death by the homeowner was a prosecutor in a somewhat rural county. This county had an area of town that was known for violent crime and m. That being said, a lot of residents had lived there for a long time. They weren't overly thrilled with how the area had developed, but were generally the kind of people who were hesitant to call law enforcement. These people started a kind of city council that would meet regularly to discuss the happenings in the area and to determine appropriate responses. Sometimes they would send bruises in to beat the crap out of someone who did something bad. This was all done hush hush without law enforcement involvement. Some officers knew a little bit about it, but it was just kinda swept under the rug as an understanding in the area. I was in a grocery store getting some lunch when I heard my partner on the radio responding to a pretty bad domestic call and asked for backup. I took off running out the store racing to my car. A kid who works at the store is all about wanting to be a cop one day and decided he wanted to come too so he raced out to his car to follow me there. I didn't realize it until I got to the house and he ran past me trying to get into the house. He doesn't talk to me anymore after the unholy butt chewing I gave him. He's a great kid but he fricked up bad that day. I've seen outsiders beaten to a pulp in Washington Heights, NYC, for transgressions against neighborhood stores or establishments. For example, a shoplifter who stole a few hats from the hat store and got into a tussle with the African guy who worked there. The entire neighborhood beat him up and all that remained was a bloodied perp and several axe handles scattered about the ground. No witnesses. TLC drivers also used to call for help in that neighborhood when one of them was victimized. You'd see a bunch of town cars converge on the spot to meet out justice on the would-be offender. Soldier, so not a cop but definitely did coin was traveling with a high-ranking officer to do talks with each person in charge of bases around Baghdad. One day we go to a base I think was called Dragon something. They tell us about how they stopped getting mortar attacks. 
That base was set up in one of the power plants around Baghdad. They keep getting mortar every couple of nights for the first few months they are there. Guy in charge finally gets out to the local townspeople around the base and tells them if we get mortared again I'm trying off the power for 3 days. Gets mortared that night. He had the workers turn off the power. People come to the gate the next day asking why the power is off being for it to be turned back on. Gate guards tell them it won't come on for x amount of days because someone shot mortared at the base. They turn the power back on. Get mortared a few days later. Guy turns the power back off. People come back asking complaining. This time the guys at the gate tell them it will be off for a week because they keep getting mortared. Two days later people come to the gate and say we got the guy who was mortaring your base. Come and we will show you. So they go out and about half a mile away they got a guy hung by his neck from a light pole. Dead. It had been two months since their last mortar attack when we visited. Guy that robbed a nearby store was beaten senseless by the community and held for cops. He was beaten so bad I think they arrested the guys holding him down as well. Not in law enforcement, just related to the question. In my country here is a very famous case of this. A 13 year old girl was raped by a 60 something year old in 1998 or something like that. Don't know if he was on jail or what but in 2005 he ran into the mother of the girl in the street and he taunted her with things like how is your daughter want to come have dinner. So she saw as he entered a bar, went get gasoline in a gas station, went to the bar, doused him and lit a match. He died some days later. I'm just telling it from memory so some details might not be exact. This was in 2005 after all. I was molested in prison. I simply waited until I knew he was doing drugs again and called his PO so he could drop dirty and be sent back. Sorry you had to go through that, glad you found a creative way to handle it. Not law enforcement. Surgeon neuropsychologist worked with a patient who suffered from a mass shooting from a man who was mentally unstable. The mentally unstable man thought the young men were trying to rob him by fire. He shot them. One patient was a drug dealer. Even though the sick man was arrested within 30 minutes of the shooting and it was clear he was sick. He got out of jail 28 days before this shooting for killing a woman who tried to steal his soul. He was cornered in jail and lit on fire by the drug dealer's mates. He died because of his injuries. I treated. Both. I have a real problem with vigilantism. Recently, a friend of mine was killed in a hit and run. He was only 21. In the immediate aftermath of his death, the usual rumor mill began. Who did it? A day later, a friend of mine began to post photos of a person whom was suspected of being the driver. Photos containing him holding a beer. Specifically, the implication being that he was a drunk who killed our friend. I called her on it. She got mad at me. She was potentially compromising an active investigation and compromising justice being served in the correct for death of our mutual friend. Posting photos of an unofficially declared suspect of a crime is not only possibly slander, it's damaging to the active investigation. She was determined to be a vigilante that caught him. I get the anger and the frustration, but you can't just go and exact your own justice without due process, there's a reason it exists. Not exactly law enforcement but my great uncle was off in the Pacific theater and a group of guys accosted his girlfriend. When he came home he beat one of them to death. I actually have a story. This was in Pakistan in my village some 40 years ago. There was some dude who would go around sneaking into people's houses to mess with the girls in the house. I'm not sure if he was a rapist or not because in our culture we try not to mention things like that. But I'm pretty sure he was. One of the dads caught him on his roof and threw an axe at him and killed him. We were sat in a local car park in my mate's car. We noticed another mate's van during the conversation. But suddenly there's a loud smash as some guy breaks the window of the van. Reaches in and takes off with a backpack. We gave Jace. This dude is running flat out down the middle of the road. My mate driving speeds past him at about 45. My other mate in the passenger seat decides to open his door and clobber the guy. There is an almighty bang and this guy catapults like a gymnast tumbler. End over end. Straight through a house garden fence and smashes the front window. He staggers out bleeding from loads of grazes and cuts and starts crying like a baby. I was like, crap that was a bit over the top. My mate grabbed the bag and kicked him back on the floor. 
He wasn't that badly injured, but crap we sped off and told my other mate he had dropped the bag in the car park. In turns out later he knew the guy, a local Sikh head and had helped him out with work, using the van and he knew there was expensive tools in the backpack. Never reported it to the police and never had any come back from it. The house was rented to students we heard and they just got the landlord to fix the fence and window. Not law enforcement, but some people nailed a suspected pedophile to a tree in a local park near where I used to live. Craps mad fricked up. Kid from a very large and very dysfunctional family is shot with a long gun while riding his bike through the projects. The kid was more of a nuisance than a criminal but his family had some real dysfunctional characters in it. This was in the summer of about 2007. Guess who are our first homicide of 2008 was? Sorry to be posting again, but this is a good story of vigilantism. My mate was starting his property business, had about 9 houses. He had a nightclub past, ran a lot of doors and his family were well connected with the city doormen. He's in bed, wife and kids, almighty crash and the feral youths from the pirate end of town had put his patio doors in, they took the keys to his BMW X5 and were gone before he got down the stairs. But to make matters worse he had left all his property's spare keys, with addresses in the car and his mobile. He rings his phone and gets 5 kids, who turn out to be 15 17 years old. They taunt him, saying they are going to break into the houses. He called the police who are next to useless and just call it in as a vehicle theft. They show no interest in the threats. So they start ringing him all night and day. Eventually it becomes a sort of who's the hardest standoff. So he gets a crew together of around 15 doormen and they find the car in a nearby town. It is being donutted around a disused shopping center. He rings the lads while watching from afar. They pass the phone amongst them, hurling abuse at him, but it gives them a chance to see who they are and who are just local kids watching the show. So they rush them tooled up. In a few seconds there are broken jaws, teeth missing and severely beaten up kids lying on the floor. This is before camera or GPS phones, so no evidence. He gets the car, keys and phone back. A few days later his phone goes and there are threats from older members of these kids gang. They are going to burn his house down. They want him to pay cash for the injuries. He gets the crew together again and finds out who this kid is. They follow him back to his parents house in the most goddamn lawless part of the city. They kick the door in and beat him senseless in front of his parents. The dad pee himself with fear and the war ended there. This might seem outrageous, but it goes on and these feral kids have no morality or limits. They only respect force. No one went to the police. My mate says they are the most dangerous people he knows and will stab someone for 50 bucks. You have to go in so hard they back down. I'm in the coast guard, a guy on a boat moored across the marina from our station shouts at people when they go too fast. He's loud as heck. I saw this when it was first posted and thought vigilantism said vandalism and I thought, that's not a very good question. Now it is I who is the dumb one. Officers of the law who drive and mark cars. What is your best are you freaking kidding me moment that you witnessed because they didn't realize you were watching? Not a cop but one of my friends was doing an undercover stakeout at night in an unmarked car in a bad part of town. This wasn't just a unmarked Crown Vic, but a seized vehicle with heavy illegal tint. Think like a ricer mobile. While he's there looking for a person of interest in a homicide this guy walks by a few times checking out the car and just looking fishy as frick. He comes back stops by the car, tries the door, then pulls out a lockout tool and tries to unlock the car. The whole time my buddy is trying to keep his crap together as this guy is trying to jack a car with a cop in it. He draws his pistol, cracks the window and flashes his gun. The guy drops his tool and just starts freaking running down the street. He radioed in a description of the guy, didn't want to blow the stake out with an arrest, and a uniformed unit picked him up two blocks away. Guy ended up being involved in an auto theft ring and brought them all down in exchange for a deal. He had one of the biggest busts of his career just walk up and try to break into his car. Best story here. I once honked at a car who changed lanes a bit too closely in front of me. Sucker was an unmarked cop car. When that silver Chevy slammed the brakes, darted behind me, and turned into a freaking EDM show, I almost crapped myself. The officer pulled me over and apologized for cutting it close. Good for him to apologize for screwing up. 
We had a guy pull into a lot next to a marked squad car and light up a joint. My buddy sitting in the car had to look around to make sure he was, in fact, in a squad car and that he was, in fact, in uniform. He was. The old adage of we don't catch the smart ones never rang more true. Some guy tried suddenly coming out of a turn lane into our lane. When we didn't automatically brake to let him in he started screaming and cursing us out, even sticking his middle finger out the window, not realizing we were cops. We lowered our window flashed the badge and hit the lights and then pulled him over. The guy started crying and apologized numerous times. My little brother is really good at spotting cops, marked and unmarked. One day we were on our way to a wedding when my brother tells my mom to make sure she's going the speed limit cause she was about to pass an unmarked cop car. She is doubtful but does it anyways. About 30 seconds later a guy on a black Ducati comes flying up behind us weaving through traffic. He squeezes between our SUV and the cop and we all cheered when the cop flipped on his lights. My mom never questions my brother anymore. I think your brother might do some drugs. I was driving from Indianapolis to Bloomington one day to visit a friend on the IU campus. I was going around 70 or so, running late, and I passed a cop in an unmarked Mustang on the side of the road. He pulled out and I got ready to pull over. He got behind me and just as he lit me up a lady in a red convertible comes flying past both of us. I looked in the rearview mirror and saw a completely stunned look on his face as if he was asking himself did this car really just blow by both of us? It took him a couple of seconds to recover, but then he pulled up beside me, pointed at me while laughing, and took off after the woman. I passed them as she was getting stopped and tooted the horn twice in thanks to her. Ooh, ooh, ooh yeah, you can never drive too fast on 37, especially around Martinsville, you'll get lit up by the cops. Not a cop. In college, my buddies and I lived in an especially affordable neighborhood. We all went to the bar one night, but soon received a call that there was a break-in. Got home and the cop told us he and his partner were driving by our house in an unmarked car when they saw an individual struggling to carry digital cameras, a t-shirt full of spare change, and an Xbox Plus controllers and games out of our house. The cop stopped to observe what appears to be a robbery in progress. But then the individual actually approached the unmarked car and attempted to sell the stolen Xbox to the cops on the sidewalk in front of our house that he had just robbed. They said it was the easiest arrest they ever made. I'm keeping especially affordable neighborhood, sir. I had a client that tried to race a blacked out charger when they first came out in his WRX. He was winning too, at least until the trooper turned on the lights in his grill. Had managed to get to 108 miles per hour from the line. Entrapment. I wouldn't have floored it if he hadn't taken the bait. Second police job was as a deputy sheriff and I'm sitting there with my partner off a highway exit at a scenic overlook eating some lunch and listening on the radio to CHP trying to corner two motorcyclists who are flying around the highway like idiots. Nowhere support is available so they terminate pursuit for safety. About 10 minutes later as I'm polishing off my fourth taco two bikes matching the description, and without any visible plates exit the highway and pull into the same overlook. They take their helmets off, listen for a few minutes, kill the bikes, and then the one walks over to start pee behind a tree. We made CHP transport them since that guy pee all over himself when we hit the siren. We were in an unmarked Subaru at the time. That got a real laugh out loud out of me. Well done. I'm on the other side of this one. I was cycling down a main road and had a green light to cross. And I was nearly run over by a massive black car that ran the light and turned into me. We both swerved to a stop. I immediately turned around and started screaming at the guy you freaking etc. You nearly killed me look where you're freaking going next time. The car was in marked police. The passenger side window rolled down and there was a guy in a baseball cap and a bulletproof vest sitting there holding a rifle. I kept shouting abuse at him until I realized. He just apologized for nearly running me over and kept on driving. I actually work probation. We drive gray slick top chargers with blue lights. We monitor people that are on GPS monitoring for the state. Occasionally these monitors go dead. They need servicing. Sometimes an offender says frick it. Cuts the unit off and goes trolling for a station wagon full of nuns or something. Well anyway, I'm in this grey charger with blue lights because it's my week to do the GPS monitoring thing. 
In my state probation officers have the same arrest powers as state troopers, DNR officers or normal police only we have statewide jurisdiction. So I come across a disabled vehicle with a big Ford behind it. There's lots of traffic and this Ford is trying to get around the disabled car. So I'm like man this dude is never getting around this car. So I turn on my blue lights. Stop traffic so he can get around safely. So I'm sitting there waving the guy through when this Indian fellow comes up on my passenger side window and he says. Officer, that guy in the truck just hit that car. He was going seriously fast weaving all over the place. Then he hit that car right there I think he's drunk. At this point I'm like wait that guy? And I point to the guy I'm letting out. And he's like that's him. So I'm like god damn it. I already have my lights on so I hit the siren. Tone change and pull him over. Long story short I end up kicking the crap out of him. Cuffing him and waiting for the local smokies to show up and transport him to jail because I don't have a cage car. Turns out he was driving down the street drinking out of a vodka bottle and orange juice bottle making little mouth sized screwdrivers with his dang 4 year old in the car. The upshot for the little 4 year old was that one of the responding officers that showed up had a thick Liverpool accent. The little girl legit thought that she was speaking to the cop Mary Poppins. Super cute. You know you're an alcoholic when you mix your drinks inside your mouth. I'm a cop. In training. But wasn't in an unmarked car. Person was playing on their phone in the middle of traffic and didn't realize what kind of car was beside him. He looks up to me. Sees me. And just gives me the finger. Apparently for looking at him. Only then does he notice my uniform. Or perhaps the big white polizzery on the side of the car. My instructor didn't believe it until I assured him I wasn't making it up. That guy ended up admitting it to my instructor. Probably the most expensive finger he ever gave someone. And the most expensive round of whatever they were playing on the phone. I am not an officer. However, this is too perfect not to tell. Mind you I was not speeding. I accelerated quickly and got in front of the sub beside me who proceeded to tailgate me. He was driving aggressively and I thought road raging. So I got over again and sped around a car in front of me and got over again. I made my turn and the guy was on my tail again. Suddenly he lights me over and my stomach drops. I pull over and a plain clothes officer gets out and approaches. He says sir, why were you driving like that? I am not a traffic officer but your erratic driving gave me no choice but to pull you. I shrugged my shoulders and responded you were tailgating me and looked angry I thought you were raging and tried to get some distance from you. He responded that's fair and walked back to his car and drove off. I did this once though I technically did speed and get a ticket for it. Some SUV was riding me pretty hard so I sped up to allow him to go around me. Mind you he was really really on my butt. Lit me up and gave me a ticket for it. I managed to get it thrown out in court because I included the prior 8 hours of recording on my dash cam showing my safe driving and not speeding once. Retired sheriff's deputy here. Was not working but in plain clothes with my young children at in tow. We were at a local street carnival in my jurisdiction. When I watched Takanis do a hand to hand transaction of some type of narcotic. I contacted the officers on duty at the carnival. And the deputy prosecutor happened to be there as well. She asked me if I would be willing to do a purchase from one of the carnival workers. I had never worked undercover and didn't really know anything about narcotics or the street lingo. I was able to buy H and have an arrest affected almost immediately. Hey I know you are off duty and your kids are here but we'd appreciate it if you'd set a good example for your kids and go buy H off that carny. Solid undercover work sir. Not an officer but every day after high school four of us took the same three mile stretch of highway home. We frequently raced each other to the last exit and the highway was usually pretty empty. One day I drove with my buddy and he pulls up next to this blacked out Ford Taurus show and looks over going about 80 miles per hour. All of a sudden a mass state trooper rolls down his passenger window to look at us. Blares his sirens. Throws all of his lights on and starts ripping down the highway. He either got something important to do or was bored and wanted to frick with some kids but we definitely chilled on the racing after that. Sounds like he sized you guys up and decided that's probably all it would take to keep you from acting like idiots in the future. We had a new hire who went twice the limit, 160 in an 80 km per hour zone, and then proceeded to cut off a policewoman in an unmarked car, as he was in a company vehicle with a clearly visible logo, security company, she called us and spoke to my boss, 
We called in the guide to the office and I fired him. He could not believe that he was fired just for going twice the speed limit. He kept saying but this is the first time I've done it. Freaking dipshit. About a month later he called my boss and asked him for bail money for a DUI. My boss just laughed and hung up on him. He was worried his parents would get angry. Goddamned moron. Obligatory not me, but my dad. He was a detective in an unmarked car, coming back from a hearing. He was not in his jurisdiction, and going 35-40 in a 35. There was a woman behind him riding his butt, which he largely ignored because he wasn't going painfully slow, in fact a bit over. She starts beeping her horn and waving her arms, swerving side to side like she was trying to find a way to zoom around him. He's also approaching the township line, putting him within his jurisdiction. Literally 5 seconds after he crosses the township line, the woman speeds around him. Funny enough, at this township line the speed limit also drops from 35 to 25. He clocks her going 55, puts on his removable police light and pulls her over. Now this is where things get funky. His car has a dash cam and records everything. This will be important soon. As he walks up to her window, she's visibly shaking in anger. He shows her his badge explains who he is, as he is in suit and tire, not standard police uniform, and tells her he clocked her at 55 and a 25. He then asks her for her license and registration, and she responds by screaming rape out the window as loud as she can. He then asks if she would be more comfortable if he called a uniformed on duty patrolman. She suddenly calms down and says it's fine. I don't remember the timeline. As I was younger, but he ends up being taken to court for assault. This woman was claiming my dad reached in her window, grabbed her breast, and said he wouldn't write her a ticket if she was willing to play ball. So my dad is mildly stressed, but has reviewed the dash cam, full audio and good quality video, with his appointed lawyer, which clearly shows none of that ever happened, and my father never even approached putting his hand inside her car. Judge hears the woman's testimony, and asks if she has told the truth. She claims she has. At that point they bring out the TV and play the dash cam. Judge informs her she should ask for leniency, and maybe she will receive a break from false charges. From my understanding, in order to avoid jail time, she agreed to a very long probation period and community service. One of my favorite, how stupid can you be, moments, and also a good lesson to not be an butthole in general. What a stupid woman. I hate when people lie about rape and sexual harassment, taking away from the real victims. I was on duty one day driving. Not in an unmarked car but a clearly marked car. It was an hour before I was to go home so I had already mentally checked out pretty much. Anyways, I am driving down a road and this car zooms past this stop sign in front of me, causing me to slam on my brakes and slam on the horn literally close to hitting him. It's funny because I exclaimed out loud to myself in the car mother sucker. I wish there was a squad car near you butthole then I proceeded to remember I was that squad car and turned around 15 seconds later and pulled him over. Yay. Had a little justice boner that day. Getting pulled over is scary enough, but a cop walking up to question me with an erection would be terrifying. Not a cop, but I want to tell the story about what happened to my son when he was about 16. He and some friends had been hanging out at DQ. They were leaving DQ in his friend's car to go to one of their houses. They had encountered some other teenagers who were taunting them and generally being buttholes. My son was in the back seat of the car and two of his friends were up front. A dark colored sedan pulled up next to them at a stoplight. Kid driving says to front seat passenger it's those buttholes again. Do something front seat passenger grabs a shoe and chucks it at the car's windshield. Well, guess who was actually driving that car? LOL. I got a friendly call from the PD to come pick up my kid, along with an assurance that he hadn't done anything wrong but had really, really stupid friends. The cop made some kind of quip as I was picking him up about Grand Theft Auto Skinny Jeans Edition. Comma the cop made some kind of quip as I was picking him up about Grand Theft Auto Skinny Jeans Edition. That's too funny. At least they took it in stride and didn't arrest his friends and throw them in jail for 3 years like al -Zaidi. I'm a cop and nothing really changes. You would be surprised the stuff I see in a marked patrol car. Some people are just that oblivious or just really don't care.
Yeah bad drivers or idiots aren't going to notice the marked Tahoe on the shoulder. The marked cruiser the lane over. Whatever. They're so self absorbed they'll just do their thing. We had a deputy get hit when someone cut across three lanes. Clipping his marked crown vic in the process because they wanted to pull in front of someone else and flip them off as part of a road rage incident. Obligatory I am not the officer but, I was driving on a 50 mile per hour limit dual carriageway, and a nice fellow with a horse box attached to his pickup decided that 0.2 inches behind my car on the inside lane was a nice amount of stopping distance for himself. Then he decided I wasn't having enough fun with just music, so proceeded to flash his lights, repeatedly, rave time, a turn off approaches. So horsey McFuckhead takes it, then decides to cut across back onto the motorway in front of me, across the chevrons, forcing me to swerve into the outside lane lest my car be written off by his clearly occupied horse box. Then it happens, the angelic humming of a siren, the majestic flashing blue lights of karma, and marked police car flies over from a little while behind me. Chasing the now speeding probable horse sucker, I passed them about 5 minutes later and tooted my woefully inadequate horn. Because I could. I was a detective off duty with my family when a jackass started following me way too close. I sped up and he did too. He pulled up next to me and he's driving a crown vic with a full police lights package and the words test vehicle on the door. He's clearly upset, turns on the lights and motions for me to slow down. He picked up a radio mic and looked like he was talking into it. I was inside of my own jurisdiction by now and called dispatch to see if they knew who this dude was. Nobody knows. Meanwhile, test vehicle turns off the road behind me to a shopping center. My wife sighs heavily as I turn around and spot him getting out of the car, wearing a sweet pair of cargo shorts. I calmly took down the tag and arrived early for work the next day cause my normal caseload was going to take a break for Mr. Test vehicle. Found out he was not a police officer but a salesman for police vehicle lights. Stroked out a warrant for impersonating a police officer and locked him up the same day. When I went over to the jail to talk to him he told me that he gets angry when people speed around him when he's driving that car. He wasn't the pervert cop impersonator type so he got a slap on the wrist but his employer was P when I told them. I'm a cop in Ohio, and I was driving a 2011 Hyundai Elantra. The police paid for it so it was really nice inside. Leather, extra speakers, etc. One day when I was out on patrol listening to some cop rap, a guy drove past me with speakers so loud that I could hear the song, Reba McIntyre, over the cop rap. So I blooped him with the siren and pulled him over. I walk up to the car and ask him what he's doing, and the tinted window rolled down. And it was Reba McIntyre. I was completely stunned. And I said I'm sorry. But a ticket's a ticket. She grinned sheepishly and said that's fine. You're just doing your job. It was one of the highlights of my career before I retired. Family member's story. A detective who drives an unmacked car. A shitbox actually to really blend. Has seen deals. Crimes in progress. But this stands out best. My cousin is a lousy driver by nature. One particular night he was being tailgated, high beamed, etc by an unhappy motorist behind him. He pulled into a gas station to let bin pass but the unsuspecting jerk followed him. You got a freaking problem. Buddy he yelled to my cousin in a thick accent. My cousin gets out in the punk look and nervous while the detective replies nope, but it looks like you do now, and flowers his badge. Arrest for driving a car with revoked registration, driven without a license possession of drug paraphernalia, along with citations for his actions before the confrontation. Just let it go when driving. Always baffles me that when you are already driving without a valid license and drugs in your car, that you would go out and behave like a moron too. Not an officer, but the idiot in the story. I was 17 and thought using a pigeon. Fast car you follow behind in the hopes they get a speeding ticket and not you. On the highway was smart. So I followed this charger in the fast lane going well over the limit. Followed him for a good 20 minutes before he quickly went in the right lane. Slowed down and pulled behind me. Then he turned on his sirens. I was following an unmarked police car. The pigeon strategy doesn't even make any sense. If you're behind them, you're easier to pull over. Okay, I am not a cop. The car was not in marked. That's why this is so are you freaking kidding me. Scene. Bridge over the interstate. 
Left lane enters the interstate. Middle and right lane go on down the road. Cop sitting in right lane with lights on as he sometimes does. Nearly the entire bridge is solid white line for that left turn lane to prevent people trying to cut in at the last moment. For people who don't realize and have missed the turn there is a very easy U-turn area right past the bridge. Some prick, who I would have sworn was blind if not for the fact he was driving a car, was at the end of that long wait for the left turn. He shoots into the middle lane, cutting me off, drives the length of the bridge, and pulls up to the light in the middle lane and stops, puts on his left turn signal. I am stuck behind him as he waits for the entire light. No one is letting this dumb frick in. This isn't that kind of city. And he clearly just didn't want to wait his turn. Not to mention the whole solid white line and easy U-turn area after the light. He could have just gone past the light and pulled a U-turn. There is a designated space for it. But no sorry Bob. Not good enough for him. So I am sitting there. Having waited the entire length of the green light for this prick. Oh and the reason the line wasn't moving is the left arrow had gone red 20 seconds before he pulled his cock baggery. Looking between the now yellow light and the cop who is staring at this guy. The light turns red. The guy then proceeds to very slowly pull out and turn left from the middle lane going through the red light. The look of utter incredulity on the cop's face as he turned on the siren and immediately pulled him over will be with me forever. Still Petey made me miss the light though. The justice boner was worth it though. Two unmarked cop cars busted me doing donuts in an empty snowy parking lot when I was 18. They were in the far corner and I didn't think much of it. After a few minutes of driving like an idiot they finally flipped the lights on and drove over. They kinda laughed at me and gave me a stern talking to but let me go. That's the right kind of policing. You weren't putting anybody in danger. Good on them. Not a cop but still a good story. I was driving home from work on a four lane road. In the left lane coming up to a red light. Naturally I came to a complete stop. At the lights I notice that there is a late model Impala in the right lane with his window down. Then out of nowhere an older boot passed me on my left. Crossing into the oncoming traffic and through a red light. In complete dismay off what had just happened I looked at the guy next to me who was already staring at me with the same stunned look on his face. So I said to the guy where's a cop when you need one the guy in the Impala said to me right here he then threw on his lights and speed after the book. Once the light turned green I drove up the road about 20 feet to see the undercover officer had pulled over the book. I gave him a honk of my horn and he threw up some finger guns at me. Not a cop but I was the other guy. I was out ripping around on my jet ski with some friends. There was no one around. So we were darting through the shallows and between islands where we legally cannot run. Must be 100 feet from shore to run at speed. These channels were 10 feet wide. We're having a great time when I see my buddy coming down the river on his Kornasaki. I decided to buzz right at him and do a donut to spray him with water from the jet. Right as I cast the handlebars and started to spin. I realized it wasn't my buddy. It was a PA game commission officer on a brand new jet ski that they had purchased discreetly patrol the river. I soaked him. I got a lot of tickets that day. From the other side of the story. I was driving along in this butthole behind me is right on my butt. So I speed up a little. Then he's trying to pass me. And since he was being a jerk. I speed up or slow down accordingly to not give him a chance to pass me. Finally, the lights come on. It's a cop. He asked me why I was going so fast. And I told him because he was riding my tail. He asked me why I would do that in front of a cop. And I said you're in an unmarked car. Luckily he was just north of town and out of his jurisdiction so he let me go. He's now the chief of police in that town. I have a similar story about a cop aggressively passing me and immediately turning right onto a side street in an unmarked cruiser. I nearly hit him due to him cutting me off and immediately slowing down and had to swerve into the left lane as not to. The cop, in plain clothes, actually had the nerve to turn around and pull me over asking why I was tailgating. What? Sitting at a stop sign in front of a school when lady speeds through said stop sign doing 50 in a 15. I pull her over and give my usual line. Is there perhaps a medical or other legally justifiable reason you ran that stop sign in from of a school doing 50 miles per hour? She said I'm having a miscarriage. No she wasn't but. So I tell that she's in luck. I'm a trained medic and I'll get an ambulance. As the ambulance is en route, the dispatcher tells me the ambulance crew wants to know if she's bleeding. 
Maybe she's heard this on my radio and I tell my dispatcher stand by. It's hot and we're in Texas. She's wearing very short shorts so I stick my head all the way in her car look down at her crotch. Then back at her and say I guess not. Huh. Still waiting for that ambulance and she grabs her cell phone and calls her husband. They are taking and she hands me the phone and says it's my husband can you tell him why I'm going to be late. Late? Thought it was a miscarriage. So I grab the phone and only tell the guy your wife having a miscarriage. I'm so sorry for your loss and immediately hung up the phone. The look on her face was priceless. Ah. Good times. She was so pee. I can't imagine how that conversation went when she got wherever it was she was going. Plus the ticket for speeding and the stop sign. And the ambulance bill. About $1,500 total. Play stupid games. Win stupid prizes. Obligatory not a cop. However, on my way to work, getting off the highway there is a left turn lane and a right turn lane. No lights. And no other options. The left turn lane is where everyone wants to go and usually does move pretty fast but still will pile up during morning rush hour. The right turn lane is very clearly marked. Yield around a smooth corner, wide painted triangle, collapsible bollards, the whole shebang. I go to turn right this one morning and this car in front of me decides to skip the 15 cars trying to go left and turns left from the right turn only lane. They sped around in an marked black SUV. Who immediately whipped on its lights and I went to work with a huge justice boner. Police officers of Reddit. What's the stupidest unluckiest criminal you faced? Kid gets arrested for shoplifting and the first thing he says to the cop is I didn't steal that freaking car this morning. The cops originally had zero reason to suspect this kid stole and crashed a car. Until he said that. It went from misdemeanor to felony in about 2 minutes. The kid distracted the cop from the shoplifting. His strategy worked. Instead of shoplifting on his record he only has grand theft auto. I was working as a mechanic about 15 years ago. I worked on a Ford Explorer that reeked of weed. Looked in the center console and found a couple of glass pipes and an empty baggie. Fixed the issue it came in for and the kid that owned it came to pick it up. First thing he does is check the center console. He gets out and says I stole all his weed. My boss comes down and asks if I took it. Nope. Tell him they can check my locker, my toolbox, my pockets and I'll take a drug test. Not good enough for the kid. He calls the cops to report the theft of his weed. A couple officers actually show up and start investigating. Kid shows them his center console where the weed was and since I was the only one to work on it I must have taken it. I told them the same I told my boss. They did a cursory search. Went back to the kid and cited him for possession of paraphernalia. I got a random two days later. I worked there for about six more years. Ha <laughs> officers. This guy stole my weed. Look. Here's my pipes and stuff but no weed so obviously he stole it. Jesus Christ man. A 911 call from some little kids playing on the phone. The father was asleep and they kept trying to wake him up when the 911 operator asked to speak to an adult. He kept yelling no. Leave me alone now we have to send someone since we can't verify there's no emergency. Upon arrival, officers ask for it and the mother has a warrant. One of my co-workers was a passenger in a car. The car got pulled over for some reason. The driver had a suspended license. The cop asked my co-worker if he had a license to drive the car. Sure did. Handed the cop his license. Oops he had a warrant for failure to appear. Not a cop. Heard a great story from one though. Officer pulled a girl going 15 plus over the speed limit on the highway. After she got her ticket and was free to go. The girl tore off. Speeding again. And got pulled by another officer a few miles later. Somehow she still didn't learn her lesson. The third officer to pull her that day arrived at her window nearly crying with laughter. Saying you do know we have radios right? That is amazing. I kinda want to know what they were thinking. Working in a prison. I met a complete idiot who was in for arson and attempted murder. This guy was gay and had been living with his new boyfriend. He also had some mental issues and smoked a lot of weed which would make him paranoid. He became convinced that his boyfriend was having an affair with a guy who lived in the apartment across the hall. And one day he was home alone and thought he could hear them having a conversation in there. He broke in and found that the guy had just left the TV on. But because he was already in he thought he'd trash the guy's apartment anyway. He made a mess of the place, then turned the gas on, 
lined up a bunch of gas canisters and lit a small fire in the dining room. The fire alarms went off. The building was evacuated and the guy went outside with everyone else to wait for the firefighters to turn up. He tried to light a cigarette but realized that he had left his lighter back upstairs. So he went back inside to get it. He made it to his floor just as the apartment exploded and one of the gas canisters he'd left in there flew through the door and hit him in the head. Luckily he'd done a crappy job of trying to cause an explosion. Most of the damage was to his own apartment through a shared wall and the only person he'd managed to injure was himself. His boyfriend was at work and the guy across the hall wasn't even gay. That sounds like a lifetime movie villain. Jesus. Or like Home Alone. I'm not a cop but I recently went to a sheriff training center to take the test to become one. One of the other candidates thought it was a good idea to bring nunchucks. He decided to whip them out and show them off to some deputies who were posted outside the center. He was arrested. One cop walked in and said if you think it's a good idea to bring illegal weapons to the cop test then you may as well not even be here today. I learned nunchucks are illegal in car. That day. Guns legal, nunchucks illegal. America is a strange place. Military police here. I was on patrol by myself working a night shift. I get a call on the radio to head to my squad and to pick up a person that would be riding along with me. As I arrive, I noticed that it was the base commander. He wanted to ride along on patrol and get first hand look at what his enlisted cops had to deal with on a Saturday night in base housing. This sort of thing never happens. You'll have better odds winning the lottery without playing than for the dang base commander to come out and do this sort of thing. So I pulled up to one of the more famous intersections in the housing area for people running the stop sign. We're sitting in the car and making small talk when he spots a car that didn't make a complete stop. He tells me to stop him and find out what their deal is. He approaches the car with me and we begin to talk to the driver. Instantly I smell alcohol emitting from his breath. I begin to say to myself that this guy is the unluckiest man in the military right now to get pulled over by the base commander while driving drunk. After conducting the standardized field sobriety tests on him and seeing how bad he did on them, he begins to break down emotionally. The base commander gets on the phone with this guy's squadron commander to include everyone in his chain of command and have them meet with him in his office in about 30 minutes. I'm putting the cuffs on this guy with another patrol as my backup when the suspect turns to us and tells us that he was set to retire the following month after 24 years of service. Now I don't know the outcome of this guy's situation but I can definitely say it wasn't good. Not trying to sound mean, but after 24 years of service he should have known better than to frick around right before he retires. Not an officer but my ex boss's son got arrested. He didn't have a license because of a prior driving under the influence of drugs conviction and was on his way to college in Colorado. He was still in Kansas and his mother, who had sworn to boss she would not let him drive, got tired and let him drive. So he goes too fast and gets pulled over. No license. Well, that's trouble. The cop asks permission to search the vehicle and they find pot. He was in an area where simple possession was still a misdemeanor, so still not too bad. Then the cop asks him about his pot use and braindead kid says oh officer, I don't smoke it, I just have it so I can sell it when I get to school if I need money, instant felony. Oh no, that sounds just like my cousin. He told the cop, no, that's not mine, I'm just taking it to my friends, that made it attempt to distribute. There's this guy that was speeding and got pulled over. He had no id and money on him. So he called his wife, told her he got caught for speeding and asked her to get him his items. In the meantime he started to chat with the cops. He got all interested in how their equipment works and as he seemed to be a nice guy, the cops let him point the laser gun at a car that was speeding into their direction. Long story short, he caught his own wife who was in a rush to bring him his id and money. And if she forgot her id and money, then the vicious cycle continues. My dad was a police officer and one of my favorite stories of his is when he was chasing a guy who ditched his car and took off during a traffic stop. The guy ran about one block, jumped over a concrete barrier and dropped. It was a good 20 foot fall down to the freeway and the guy broke his leg. My dad ran over and looked down as the guy crawled to the middle climbed rolled over between the concrete barriers blocking the two directions. He called down. That's a good spot, just hang out there and then radioed for his partner to bring the car around. 
Overall the guy was fine but my dad said he lived in the area and either panicked and forgot where he was or knew he was jumping that far and thought he would make it. Blindly jumping into oblivion like that happens more often than one would think. I'm one of two civilian employees at a PD. We get our regulars, and this guy is one of them. Recently, he got out of jail and decided he was going to go visit his girlfriend that same day. The only problem is, she had a no contact order out against him. She calls the police and they come to pick him up. He also had some other illegal things on him, so he got taken straight back to jail. He'd only been out for a few hours. But wait, there's more. So, his girlfriend has a no contact order against him, which isn't like a restraining order where you can't go within a certain distance of them. It's literally no contacting them. Well, this smart guy decides he really wants to talk to his girlfriend, so he called her from jail. Three times, she called the police again and they went back to the jail and added more charges. Violation of a protective order x4. He was smart enough to violate a protective order while he was in jail. Group of friends mug a couple of tourists. One of the muggers is for some reason carrying his own passport, which he drops as they run off. Not quite the same, but I'm continually amazed at the number of drug users who expect to get their stash returned. The first time you're caught with a small quantity of cannabis in the UK you normally get given a caution there and then on the street. You don't get arrested or anything. I've dealt with more than a couple of people who genuinely expected that interaction will end with me handing back their drugs. You seem to have some crappy friends. My family is good friends with the local sheriff. He's told me a story where an officer pulled over a man who was quite obviously under the influence. When he went to the car to talk to the man. He noticed him making a stabbing motion towards his leg. The man had stabbed himself with a screwdriver and tried to say he'd been stabbed at a bar and was heading to the uh, he was heading out of town. In the direction where the next hospital or clinic was about 45 minutes away. And that's why his driving was wonky. If he'd been caught with another DUI, he'd have lost his license. He ended up losing his license anyways, and had a lot of hospital bills to pay. We've had several over the years who have broken into a house or car and then left on foot following a snowstorm. No need for a canine to track them down. Also had a guy who had sharp lifted and he knew we were looking for him in the mall. We found him hiding in a store and also found the weed he had tried to hide in the pocket of a jacket near where he was hiding. He denied the weed being his until I opened up the paper it was crumpled up in. It was his bond paperwork from the day before where he had been arrested for shoplifting. I took him back in front of the same judge who had released him so he could be arraigned on his new charges. She was not happy with him and revoked his prior bond. Also had a guy dine and dash, but left his wallet with it on the table. Not a cop, but no several because of a convenience store job I held where cops came frequently for free coffee and soda. It's related. We were really desperate for third shifters to the point where my boss hired a friend of my co-worker. Kid was a complete freaking moron. Had a face tattoo, was small and he was told to keep it covered with makeup which, to his credit, he did. Had to have concepts explained to him multiple times, could barely count change so we had to put him in the back doing stocking. One day, I get called in because he had apparently been arrested. He had apparently offered to sell drugs to another customer in the store, in full view of one of the four police officers that were in the store that day. They searched his car and found a mess of pills and pot. According to one of the cops, he claimed that he didn't know that they were in there since it was his mother's car. So they searched her house and found more. Both were arrested. We responded to a bank robbery in progress. Caller surprisingly gives us a good description of both the suspect and the vehicle he got in. Luckily I was only a couple blocks away. I pull on scene and holy crap. Matching car is still right out front. I pull and draw down on the suspect. Backup gets there and we get him into custody no issues. After speaking with the suspect. He was still sitting there because his car wouldn't start and he was sitting there cranking the key trying to get it to start. TLDR. When you rob a bank leave your car running. Then we could have a funny story about a bank robber getting his car stolen while doing the robbery. Not an officer, but my roommate in college was trying to steal a street sign with a couple other guys. A cop car rolled up with its lights on and they all fled in different directions. Roommate ran a block away through backyards and hid in an open garage. 
He thought he was free, but a cop on foot found him almost immediately. It had snowed hard earlier that night and he just followed the tracks right to the garage. Guy tried to steal a frozen chicken by putting it under his hat, cooled his head too much and he had a blackout before he could leave the store. I heard a good story once that took place in my hometown, from the halcyon days when light up sneakers were not just for kids. A gentleman with such footwear decided it would be wise to flee on foot from a traffic stop into the pitch dark woods. This happened last week. We get a call to the projects of 620 hours for a domestic, a known drug apartment. While we are responding, our dispatcher is advising us that the caller, complainant, owns the apartment and that the couple that are staying with her are having the domestic. As we are getting closer, the dispatcher tells us that the couple is breaking everything in the apartment. We get there, everyone is calm, but the apartment has some furniture broken. We run everyone's licenses. The caller, complainant, has an active warrant. She gets arrested and proceeds to resist, because she is high. The boyfriend has an order of protection against him from his girlfriend who he is standing next to. He gets arrested. The girlfriend admits to breaking the furniture. She gets arrested. 3 for 3. Hilarious. My uncle is a beat cop. He once had to intervene in a brawl between drunk chaps and a knight. Apparently, two drunk louts decided to harass a street performer dressed in a genuine looking plate armor. It quickly evolved into a hilarious fight where the chaps would wail at the impervious knight and injure themselves by punching edges of steel plate. Before they were separated, one of the chaps was badly messed up by being headbutted by a guy in a steel helmet. Wisely, my uncle and his partner decided to let the knight go, since the guy would normally face charges for using a weapon of sorts. During a brawl, your uncle is a very good man. My dad was a cop in the housing projects in Brooklyn. Once there was a report of trespassing and him and his partner had to clear every floor of this building. They get to the roof and find a man shoving a full, unpeeled banana up his butt. My dad loved telling me this story, and it never fails to make me giggle. We never did find out why he was doing it though. Saw a guy pushing his car through an intersection. When my light turned green I naturally went to investigate. Guy had the hood put up and flagged us down and asked for a jump. Ran the plates as a sop thing and tags are clean. But they go to blue Toyota and this is a gold Suzuki. Run the VIN on the car and it comes as stolen. Guy says his sister let him drive her car. We say no problem we'll sort it all out if that's the case. Eventually he asks how he can get his stuff out of the trunk. We say he can get it back after we sort it out since it's his sister's car right? Then he tells us now the car belonged to some white dudes. I have a bunch of stories. My dad is a RCMP officer and was stationed in Alberta for most of his career. On one occasion some guy was sitting in his attic with a gun waiting to kill police officers that were on their way to his residence. The dog handler was one of the guys that arrived on scene and sent his massive German shepherd into the house. This thing was apparently pitch black and absolutely ferocious. The dog later died on duty and has a statue in BC. Anyways, this dog got into the attic and chased the gunman down, clamped onto his shoulder with his teeth and started tearing him apart. The guy panicked, fumbled with his gun, and in the ensuing chaos, blew his own head off. Dog was called off and my dad arrived in time to see the guy's body being pulled out of the attic. Group of girls hands me a set of keys they took from a sloppy drunk kid who'd been unsuccessfully hitting them in a popular college bar and tried to get into his car and drive off. I said one of them flirted with him on the driver's side while her friend snuck in on the passenger's side. Find the kid passed out behind the wheel of a car parked nearby. Passenger doors wide open but driver's door is closed and locked. Knocked on the window strobed my flashlight at him for several minutes. Notice he's got half a dollar bill sticking out of the CD player like his final act of consciousness was hoping for a Snickers. Finally he wakes up, looks at me, thinks I'm telling him to move along, and tries to start the car but fails because there's no keys. Then he can't figure out how to unlock the car from inside. I figure I'll help him out and use the keys to unlock it, only to find out I'm holding Jeep keys. And he's sitting in a Chrysler. He blames the bar for letting him get so crappy. Still had no idea that wasn't his car. Shows me a military, active duty marine corps instead of his regular DL in hopes of getting out of trouble. He's 19. Has no friends to call and doesn't know where he's staying. 
spends the rest of the trip to holding begging me not to tell his company. Military police here. Thing about getting into trouble in the service is that for some things, like a DUI, you get into trouble both with us and the local law enforcement. There was this real junior guy who was driving back to his barracks room drunk. Somehow he went completely off the road and crashed into a fire hydrant, fricked up his new car and did a pretty considerable amount of property damage too. Anyways, this guy decides that before we get there, he is going to leave. That's not so dumb. The dumb parts when he walks back to the scene an hour later, claiming he had his car stolen and this was the first he had seen it. Not only did he still have his keys on him and I guess there was a witness that put him at the scene, but he is also very visibly drunk and injured. He was also underage, which on the civilian side might not count for much but in the military you can get in a lot of trouble just for that. But when we bring him back to the station, he refuses to tell us who gave alcohol to a minor, which I guess means he's loyal. But when he's in that much trouble already he really should have just told us. Anyways. So in the end the guy not only has to pay hefty ticket. Gets knocked down in rank. Has to pay for his car and the property damage. But I'm pretty sure he got a dishonorable discharge as well. Getting that kind of discharge takes away pretty much all your benefits and makes it ridiculously hard to find a job. Yep. Get a dishonorable and it's like having a felony on your record to potential employers. Not a cop. But I have a few that stand out from friends cops I've interacted with. First, our base's mental health psychologist was married to a highway patrolman. One time they were out at the local harbor with their kids, about to enjoy a late lunch. As they are walking up, about 100 yards away, they see a guy stumbling to his car. He proceeds to get in, and then instead of backing out, he goes forward, into a planter and tree. Her husband casually walks over, reaches in, and takes the keys, cuffs the guy, and calls the local police. He learned as a rookie, always carry his set of cuffs even off duty, you never know. Next one, I was performing on a guard duties for Veterans Day, and they had us presenting the colors with a bunch of local officers. Before the event, we are all hanging out in a room, and we ask, what's the funniest most fricked up story you have? One local cop says, I have this, and no one will top it. He told us how he had to arrest a 19 year old for having sex with a 12 year old in the 19 year old's van. When they arrested the 19 year old, he stated, but I thought she was 14. In California, the law is if there is a 5 year or less difference, they won't prosecute unless the parent's victim wants to. Unfortunately, that only applies to minors who are 16 and up, so 14, still very illegal. Not a cop. But it was a story in my town's newspaper. So, this genius gets the bright idea to shoplift some movies and video games from my local Walmart. He puts the items in his shopping cart, picks up a box cutter from the tool aisle and finds a blind spot in the toy section. While trying to remove the box cutter from its package, he slices his hand open. In his ensuing panic, he throws blood all over the place and runs to the restroom. Security is alerted of the open package and all they have to do is follow the blood trail and they find the culprit crying and licking his wounds in one of the restroom's stalls. On top of the shoplifting charge, he was also ordered to pay for all the items that got blood on them. I think it was around $250. TL. DR. Shoplifter sucks at hide and seek. I don't think they can charge him with shoplifting if he didn't technically steal anything yet. He was still in the store with all the items, would never hold up in court. My sister is a cop, she once turned on her lights to respond to a robbery, and a nearby car took off, dispatch told her to pursue the car, as others were also responding to the robbery. After a high speed chase through a residential neighborhood, he takes off on foot and escapes, in the car, he left a trunk full of ecstasy and his pee off girlfriend, who tells where he lives. Guy is busted on all kinds of charges for the chase and one of the biggest ecstasy busts in the department's history. All because he saw the lights on the squad car and panicked. Police of Reddit. What is the absolute worst crime scene you've come across? Saw a little kid standing on a busy street corner, in the dead of winter, around 2 or 3 years old. Went up to him to talk to him and found out he had been standing out there for an hour or so while a good Samaritan kept eyes on him from across the street in his nice and warm house. 
eventually led the investigation back to a battered woman's shelter nearby. The manager recognized the kid and said his mom was upstairs in another room. Went up there and found out she died from a rage overdose a few days prior. Broke my heart to think that kid had been in that room with his dead mother for days with little food or water. Probably crying that his mother wouldn't wake up or talk to him. Dunno whatever happened to him after that. Lost kids are common in my city. But this one wasn't just the forgetful tourist who didn't keep track of their kid while they snapped photographs everywhere. Was intense for a while. As we pulled resources from neighboring counties to put out the alerts for a priority lost child. See. No one explains how stuff like this can affect you when you let it into your life. No one warned me. And freaking heck. Yay. Holding my babies is the only thing that really helps. <laughs> Journalist. Not police. But I was often at the same sorts of scenes. 1. Partial decapitation in a car accident. A drunk kid hit a small car at high speed. Tore the top completely off. Driver's body was still heaving and convulsing in the front seat. Brains and tongues splattered over groceries in the back seat. 2. Hugely obese drug dealer goes into his attic to retrieve his stash. This is in Georgia in the summer. Collapses from the heat and dies. Takes neighbors a few days to notice the smell. Takes a few more before they figure out where, exactly, it's coming from. The police had to cut a hole in the roof of the house to pull his bloated corpse out. He fell apart into goo as they were doing it. The smell was insane even a quarter mile down the road, once the roof was opened up. 3. Woman who had been killed by a serial killer. Unofficially, the cops on the scene said they had seen this sort of thing a number of times so they thought it was a serial killing. Was never proven. She was a prostitute and he had beaten her to death and then tightly packed all of her orifices with dirt before dumping her. 4. Train vs car. A mom tried to beat a train with her kids in the car. Train was too fast. When I got to the scene there was a child's head just sitting on the ground. Completely normal except for the fact that his was detached and the body was nowhere in sight. People who try to beat trains are idiots. I'm no cop. But my stepfather wanted me to tell his story. Here goes. My father got a call about a car crash. Usually they're pretty bad. But this one was the worst he'd ever seen. The car had two parents. And four kids inside. The parents were pulled out immediately. And neither had serious injuries. They were both understandably scared about their children. So he put on some rubber gloves and went into the flipped car. All of them were dead. And none were clean deaths. The youngest spine was protruding from his back. And the oldest was missing most of his head. Another had his face mangled by debris. And the last one was cut in the abdomen by his cest belt. And there were a fair amount of organs hanging out. He had no clue what to do. He didn't want those parents to see that. So he wrapped them up inside of the car. When the mother saw the smallest one come out in a bloodied blanket. She fell to the ground and just. Screamed. The father walked up to grab the child. And my stepfather just said sir. I don't think you want to see this. And the father just started to wail unlike anything my stepdad had ever heard. I'm so sorry. He choked out. And after they'd taken the bodies. He was there to clean up and investigate. While he was searching. He found a small. Bloody sock sitting on the ground. He told me it was the only time he'd ever cried on the job. In his words. I've seen grown men blow their brains out. I've seen people beat their spouse until their face was mush. Heck. I even had to reach into someone's chest cavity once to resuscitate them. But I'll never forget those kids. God bless your daddy. I hope he finds peace. I'm not in law enforcement. But ended up working very closely with them on one case that presented to Maya. A newborn infant had been microwaved by her mother's boyfriend because she wouldn't stop crying after he sexually violated her when changing her diaper. The baby's uncle found the baby and got enough neighbors gathered to set the boyfriend on fire. Police came in first with the baby. They gave me a heads up that the boyfriend might follow but they decided to wait for ambulance to show up and transport him. <laughs> Probation officer for violent sex offenders here. I've got a few I could add to this but this one sticks with me as the worst. A doctor in the children's department at a very popular hospital was raping the preteen terminally ill girls during the night shift. This went on a couple times a month for years before he was finally caught. One of the girls lived longer than the doctors expected and complained of pains. During an inspection they discovered the rape and posted cameras which eventually caught him. 
He ended up getting probation because he a could afford great lawyers who got him in front of a sympathetic judge and b most of his victims were dead. He'd up the pain meds before the act so that there would be less resistance. The court never knew the extent of his deviance, but after I finally got his polygraphs back we learned the full story. He eventually died in custody after we got him on a violation. I'm not a cop, but a good friend of mine is and he recently told me a story. A few weeks ago he got a call to a homicide. A 25 year old male had killed a 63 year old male. The victim was a father to a 17 year old high school girl. The girl had recently began dating a known thug drug dealer. The girl's parents had tried to tell her she couldn't date him, but she did it anyways as an act of rebellion. Long story short, the guy stabbed the father about 30 times with a chef's knife found in the owner's kitchen after an argument ensued. The argument was over him not dating his daughter. Looks like dad was right. When my buddy, the cop, showed up he said the whole kitchen was literally covered in the man's blood. He said the corpse looked like a sliced cow carcass. Both the girl and her mother were sitting in their dad husband's blood crying hysterically. And this, kids, is why you listen to your parents. Cop here. Not the worst crime scene but an interesting one. I was dispatched to a call where the wife found her husband unresponsive in his office. I show up, the room is dark, and I find the man in his chair in front of his computer screen. The screen is off but I can hear that the fan on the PC is still running. Anyhow, the guy is elderly and is obviously dead. His right hand is seized up into a jacking off position and his fly is down with the Vienna sausage limp and exposed. Obviously this dude had a medical episode while whacking the weasel. At this point the wife is completely unaware of the circumstances surrounding her husband's death due to the room being dark, his close proximity to the desk, and her reluctance to approach the body. Some time passes, the Emmy shows up with body removal, and the guy is wheeled away. As I am wrapping up the scene and the wife is in another room with family, my curiosity gets the better of me. I know for a fact that at his age the guy needed some visual stimulus at a minimum to prime the pump. Remembering that the computer was on, but the screen had shut off, I reached for the mouse. When I moved the mouse, the screen turned on to holy dear god of all that is horrible on the internet. Let's get one thing straight, as a male, I have seen my fair share of what is out there in the naked world, but what popped up on that screen was about 20 open tabs of the darkest p the darkest parts of the web has to offer. What struck me most was the amount of painful looking gay torture p this guy had open. Not going to lie, at this point I felt like a teen again afraid my mom was going to walk in at any moment. I was at a crossroad. Do I break the news to his grieving wife and family a couple rooms over? Heck no. I closed all those tabs and hope this guy was browsing on private. To dead guy, I hope that I was a bro for you even though I didn't know you. And if anyone ever finds me in that same situation please do the same for me. R.I.P. dead guy. Not in the police. But I just finished serving on a jury for a capital murder trial a couple of weeks ago. Basically a guy beat his 2 year old son to death and during sentencing it came out that he molested his 4 year old daughter as well. As part of the trial we had to view all the forensic photos of this poor kid. 84 bruises, 15 broken ribs, head contusions, brain hemorrhage, lacerated intestine, and the list went on and on. Most of the jurors were shaking with rage when we returned to the jury room that day. Your honor, we find the defendant guilty of all charges, plus some more we just came up with. We also sentence the defendant to death by disembowelment. Um, that's not how this works. I wasn't on the call itself but was relieving units who needed a break. They were dispatched to a home after the father came home to a grisly scene. Apparently him and his wife were having marital problems. They had three kids. Not sure what the issue was but the next day after a huge argument the husband went to work. While at work the wife said I'll show him. She took his loaded shotgun and while the kids were napping shot them one by one. First the toddler, then the middle child. The oldest woke up. She consoled him until he fell back asleep and then shot him as well. Then she left a heartfelt note about how it was all his fault that she did this. She then blew her head off in the foyer for him to find when he got home. He came home to losing his entire life. That one was one of the most disturbing and vile things I've ever experienced. 
I've grown to feel numb to almost anything due to this job but that one still makes me sad. I'm not sure what happened afterwards but I believe he killed himself months later. We can blame him? I'm a bit late to the party, but here goes. My stepfather worked traffic homicide for years, and encountered any number of frankly gruesome things. But the story I remember really sticking out in my mind involved a car hitting an electric pole on a rainy night. The car's occupant had, in the course of the accident, become decapitated, had sheared completely off. The electric pole was severely damaged, one of the lines breaking and falling down to rest in a puddle, which now also contained the severed head. The electrical charge was, apparently, causing the head to bounce and sizzle in a very disconcerting fashion, to put it lightly. Not completely what OP is looking for, but a horrible scene nonetheless. My grandfather's friend was a truck driver for many years, and on one night while he was driving, a car swerved across the median and hit his truck head on. Killed everyone inside the car, and to make it worse, they had just crossed into America legally so this small sedan had about 6 more people than it should have held stuffed into hollowed out places. So when he hit the car, a red mist just exploded out. He had people stuck up under the hood of his truck and it was a huge mess. Fricked him up for a while. Probably fricked up any responding officers too. I had an old co-worker who used to drive the 18 wheeler for our company and had a man commit suicide by walking out in front of his truck. He could no longer drive or ride in a vehicle after that. Would ride his bike or walk to work. I hope your grandfather's friend ended up being somewhat okay after. I'm sure it's hard to come back from that. I once went to a scene where her ex-boyfriend show up at the house where the girl lived. He knocked and then started firing a shotgun through the door, hitting a toddler. He then went in and shot the girl's mother. I still remember chunks of flesh and underarm hair stuck to the wall. Shot the father and then left. The girl was out for the evening. He then left the gun and a suicide knot at the top of a bridge. He went on the run instead of killing himself and was captured shortly thereafter by the marshals. Fricked up scene. I posted the same story on a similar topic a while ago, but here goes. Several years ago I attended a student state police academy, ages 15-17. One of the students asked our drill instructors what were their weirdest calls. A few funny ones went by, like a trooper stopping a box truck loaded from the bottom to top, every square inch filled with dead goats and then having to figure out who to call to make sure this isn't a health core violation. The final state trooper to respond to their weirdest call story was probably one of the more tougher, more serious and older drill instructors. At the time, he was a trainee assigned with a field training officer. The pair of troopers respond to a neighbor's complaint and were greeted at the residence by a heavily inebriated male individual, completely nude besides a small tutu dress around his waist. At this point, this imagery produced a few snickers in the group. He went on to say that the individual had an erection with blood all over, but no visible signs of a cut. Upon further inspection, the troopers found, stuffed under the kitchen table, an unconscious three-year-old, bleeding from the anus, because the inebriated individual was her father, who had just finished raping her in his drunken state. While that in it of itself is an image nobody should see, I'll never forgot the trooper's description of having to restraining his field training officer from blowing that guy's brains out. The FTO drew his firearm and put it right to the guy's head and was probably going to blow this guy's brains out if the trainee had not tackled him. That's some real emotion right there. It's easy for us to sit in hindsight and say we wouldn't have shot this guy. That's against the law, but in the heat of the moment, would you have? It goes to show you that under stress, anybody, anyone, can do anything. Also we'll never forget people's mild laughing smiles going completely stone cold serious when the story progressed. Literally like a bomb went off. For me it was like time froze. I don't remember anything but visualizing that story even though I know it was 100 degrees out. And we were all just sitting in the grass getting bitten by bugs enjoying the moment up until then. Unfortunately, for many in police fields, that's the sad reality of it. And if that doesn't send shivers up your spine, I don't know what could. God bless those that deal with these people. Sometimes you wonder why these cops look grumpy and all serious, but after a story like that I've learned to look at these people and see in their faces they've seen heck. My father-in-law is a retired state trooper. He was called to respond to the two-vehicle accident near his home. 
That's where he spent his final minutes with his wife before she died trapped in her vehicle. There was a post on here a while ago from a cop where some guy grabbed a baby, put it under his arm and ran at the wall using the baby's head as a battering ram. The baby somehow survived and the guy was arrested. A bunch come to mind, hard to rank them because they are all so unique. One was a 95 year old lady who lived alone and stopped answering phone calls from her son. He went to her house and found her about a week later. She died while in the bathtub. Her head was resting on the edge of the tub, looking up, with her mouth extremely wide open. She had hundreds of bugs pouring out of her eyes, nose and mouth. It was straight out of a horror movie, you could smell it from the front porch. I felt really bad for her son. No one should ever have to see their mother like that. Posting on the behalf of my friend sitting next to me. Worst crime scene I've been to was 6 month year old baby being thrown out a 6 story window because the mother believed she was possessed by the devil. Friend's dad is a cop. Keep in mind this was during a really bad ice storm a few years ago, and in the country, about a good 15-20 minutes from a town, and wasn't a very busy road. Got called from a woman saying she hadn't talked to her mom in a few days, which was weird since they talked every day. Went to go check on her, drove up to the address, and saw a truck sitting in gate. Got out and walked up, didn't see anything in or around the truck, decide to walk past. That's when I saw it. Old lady was by the mailbox. She fell into a puddle and had literally frozen over. Fire department had to come to basically burn her out. Then I decided to walk up to the house after calling in what happened. Door was slightly open. I walked in and announced myself. No answer. Walked around. And her husband had died staring out the window at her. He was handicapped and in a wheelchair. Didn't have any power in the house for a week. And didn't have a cell phone. He died watching his wife freeze to death. Dear god this is sad. This is a story I got from the local police lieutenant during an interview for a college paper. It was Halloween night, and my campus has a somewhat notorious Halloween party throughout town. Police actually walk the streets in riot gear that night, and normally get a lot of nice costumes. Dudes, anyway, they get a call to break up a fight at a house party. They arrive and are trying to push through all the drunk people to find who's actually fighting. They got to the fight which was actually taking place the next house over on the sidewalk, but a second too late. They watched as one kid pushed the other in front of a speeding tow truck, basically causing this kid's body to explode into a bloody mess. I think the kid who pushed him got involuntary manslaughter or something like that. Not police, I am a student studying crime. Went to a lecture given by the head of the missing person department in our country. It's not the worst the guy has seen. He has investigated the type of serial killers that kidnap, rape and murder underage girls in his basement, but it was the story that stuck to me the most. A 6 year old girl went missing. Search teams couldn't find the girl. All leads ended up nowhere. Eventually after 2-3 weeks of the girl being missing, they find her. Dead body in the trunk of a parked car in a random parking lot. He said that in the missing person's business this is good news because bad news is better than no news. After finding the body they drove to the parents home. He said that when you drive up onto the driveway and are about to open the car door, you realize that 10 seconds later you are going to knock on their door, and 10 seconds after that they are going to open that door and you are going to destroy those parents lives. Attended scene autopsy of a 13 year old who was hunting with his 11 year old brother and accidentally shot him dead center in the back of the head with a slug meant for deer. The kid looked bad enough when I got there and had already expired, his face looked like a facehugger if you want context. Feel really really bad for the brother as he attempted to do CPR and stuff. Obviously in a panic as his brother was likely just expelling blood everywhere and not actually still alive. This poor kid will not only remember shooting his little brother but actually seeing the aftermath and putting his face on it. Obviously far worse for the kid than anyone else. This one's a bit of a cliche, and not really a crime scene. Few months old DOA. Elderly women with no family, just two dogs. Family out of state asked for us to check on her. Got into her apartment. She had been dead a few months. Other than the smell, the sight of her eaten off fingers by the starving dogs that were there. I'm going to guess you mean a cliche. A clique is a group of people. Tragic, though, 
Old folks living alone seems to not be a good idea. Cop friend of mine was first on the scene to the monkey ripping that woman's face off in CT. He had serious PTSD after that. I work at a police department reviewing old cases. I'd say the worst I've ever come across, so far, was an older man who was found dead in his home by his son. Doesn't sound too bad at first, until you see realize that he was found kneeling next to his bed, pants around his knees, playboy on the bed in front of him, and dong still in his hand. Dead two days and found by his son mid fap. Actually you would be amazed by how many corpses are found photographed partially or fully naked. A lot of them are found in the bathroom with their pants down, collapsed onto the floor with poop in the toilet on the floor on the person. I'd say 80% of our untimelies are found partially naked with poop somewhere nearby. Currently just a volunteer, but hoping to hold the official title and role soon. A few months back there was a call out to someone who had jumped in front of a train. Fairly certain it was done purposefully, but no one knows for sure, and I haven't followed up on it. The lady had her legs severed, and her stomach area was caved inwards. Sort of like in those cartoons where their stomachs are flat against the road after being run over, but with more intestines and stuff that had burst out of various exit points from the pressure, was given the option to go home for the day after that, but decided to stay. Some guy later in the day called us, good for nothing pigs, which made me realize how quick people are to judge us, without even knowing what we do or have to deal with, was very new to it at this point, not a good day. And police. 1. Man who had his head chopped away down to his chin by a rim head with a tobacco knife. Said M head had previously been cutting the grass with the knife, before flipping his lid and removing the victims. 2. Fatal wreck where a man hit a loaded dump truck head on. His vehicle disintegrated pretty much. He slid on the pavement, grinding his legs off to the upper thigh. Scattered most of his body along the roadway. 3. An elderly man died while under a heating blanket. Cook low and slow for a couple of days. 4. Lady died in a bathtub. This makes people stew. Water bodies suck. It goes on and on. They all have their little quirks that make them the worst in their own unique special snowflake kind of way. Not me by my police trade school teacher told me a story of such a fricked up crime scene he was a part of. There was this beautiful woman could have been a model, and she was naked in the floor of her hotel room her head not attached to her body and blood everywhere. The entire hotel was a crime scene and my teacher kept seeing cops sneak in to see the hot dead chick and my teacher who had command was furious. He kicked them all out and tried to do his job. Until his higher up, I think a lieutenant, came in by asking around I heard the hot headless chick was here. Since he was a higher rank the second he stepped in he took command of the scene and my teacher never did find out what happened except some cops care about seeing a hot corpse than doing their job. I'm pretty sure being headless takes a corpse from hot to not. The Icicle Man. Outside of smaller city in Idaho, Pop. 27k, is a kind of shanty town affectionately known as welfare. The only business is a little convenience store a lady runs out of her house. Welfare, it has at least a 90% unemployment rate. Anyways, it's the dead of winter and around minus 20 degrees F. Get a call about a missing persons. A man of 70 hasn't been seen or heard from in over month. Get at his trailer home and come across the following scene. Man's gas had been shut off due to lack of payment but electricity was still on. Man had water bed with an electric heater to warm the water. Looks like man had been stabbed on the bed. He rotted down to essentially a soup-like consistency. His liquefied remains had dribbled off the edge of the heated water bed to form intricate icicles off the edge. The icicle man was the absolute worst. Former paramedic here, was called to a murder scene, not for the victim, but for a rookie female cop who starting vomiting and then became catatonic at the scene. A woman had killed her husband with a blast from a shotgun. He was drunk, naked, and farted right in her face at the dinner table. She got the gun, shoved it into his stomach, fired, and blew the back half of his torso away. Then, after he was already dead, she put it in his mouth, and blew his head off. The cop was unable to continue, and resigned a few days later. My dad used to work D. He told me about how they figured out the cartels used to use stillborns and orphans to traffic drugs. They would kill the kids and preserve them so that they could stitch C and H inside their bodies. 
They would hand the stuffed kids off to a girl that looked like a mom and they would pretend their kid was sleeping when they were crossing a border. Went on for years until a drug dog attacked one of the stuffed infants and sea snowed everywhere. I was on vacation in Tokyo a long time ago. Strolling through the streets one day I came to a train crossing and several pedestrians stopped as the train approached. One guy, a mid-fifties salaryman in a cheap suit, turned to me, put his finger over his lips and said SHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHH
We knew she had died as we could smell her from outside. The fire department knocked down her door. I told the firefighter to go in and he was like no way. It would be an emergency. Fully knowing that she was almost 100% dead. Lights were all turned off and it was 2am so each room I had to flip the switch. There were bloody paw prints all over the place and in the bathroom. The toilet seat had been flipped up and there were bloody paw prints all around it as well. When I flipped the bathroom light I was pretty sure what I would see but it was worse than I had expected. The cats had started to eat her after she had died. I was 19 at that time. It seems I have scrolled too far down the comments tt. I'll keep this one short. We responded to a call where a mid 50 something year old semi frail looking male bit his early 20 year old something son. Who probably outweighed the father by about 150 pounds or so. About 25 times all over his body. Everywhere. Arms. Neck. Torso. Legs. It was ridiculous. They were deep marks too. Like he was trying to rip skin away. Apparently they got into an altercation over who knows what and the wife mother had to break it up by threatening them both with a large kitchen knife which the police confiscated. But the kicker was. There were no drugs or alcohol involved. Another was when we responded to a child who fell and hit his head on a tire that was sitting in their yard. Why it was there. I have no clue. But anyways. I went to check his pupils when I noticed one was completely fricked up. It looked almost like a tiny cat's eye. I almost flipped an absolute crap because this kid seemed perfectly fine. Vitals good. Talking to this properly. But the size of his pupil when compared to the other indicated moderate to severe head trauma. Plus the whole abnormal pupil shape which I've never seen before. Well after I flipped a crap to myself. I asked the mother. It turns out he was stabbed in the eye by his sister with a pencil when he was younger. This my friend is why you must always get a good patient history. My mother who was a case manager for a while had two interesting stories. A homeless woman who was a paranoid schizophrenic came into my mother's office with a severe infection in her foot. When my mother asks her if she thinks she's ready to be discharged, she proceeds to tell my mom that she did not have an infection in her foot but that she was turning into a pterodactyl. And the other is that another man who had schizophrenia explained to my mother that the voices in his head told him to cut off his dong and feed it to his dog. And he did. Okay, I'm an EMT. One of my teachers told me once about the craziest call he's ever received. He's sitting at the station and he gets a call for a lacerated finger. They arrive at the house and sure enough, a woman is sitting at the table with an extremely bloody finger. They patch up the wound and head out the door. And before they get on the truck, the woman taps him on the shoulder and says, That's not really why I called you. And he says, Well, what's the issue, mom? And she responded with, I crap you not. I have razor blades in my fanny. Apparently this woman had a sleeping disorder, in which she would sleepwalk and put crap in her tea and butt. Well I suppose that's a fairly decent contraceptive. I'm a volunteer EMT. A chubby lady in her 30s made a 911 for severe abdominal pain. It's 2 in the morning so I just woke up, tired and drowsy. As my partner and I get to her house, the husband is there at the door and tells us it's no big deal. We walk inside and find the woman laying on the floor on newspapers surrounded by cats. Must have been 4 or 5 cats laying next to her, licking her tea. Yes, the woman was giving birth. She did not know she was pregnant. We saw the little baby being delivered next to cats. Even worse, they had their 4 year old boy stand next to her as he watched his mother gave birth in pain. The little boy was crying. The cats were still licking her. The husband was standing there like it was no big deal. We had to call our county back and update them about the situation. They sent paramedics to assist. The cops showed up before we even got there. Told us it was ugly. They were right. When I was still doing clinicals for my EMTB cert, I had a ride along with a company that serviced rural areas. The first call we went to was a woman with chest pains. We pulled up to a house that looked like it was made with toothpicks and styrofoam. It was a dilapidated shanty in the middle of the woods. Cue the drop of my stomach knowing this is going to be a weird one. We walk in and the floor is dirt. Not covered in dirt. Actual dirt. There was a burn barrel in the corner, no electricity, and a dingy mattress on the floor covered in tattered blankets. The PT looked rather weary while I was checking her vitals and I could see the shame in her eyes. We put her in the back of the truck for transport. 
I gave her some nitro, and tried to talk with her a bit. It was a really sad and strange thing, and it still sticks out in my mind 7 years later. Of course, we had a looped out drug user later in the day that was weird too. But only because I've never seen someone enjoy drinking activated charcoal that much. We were dispatched to an elderly couple's residence, with a woman calling in to report that her husband had fallen in the shower. Groans from myself and my partner as we bantered about who would have to deal with the soggy old man parts should anything be wrong down there. We reach the residence and are led upstairs to the shower, where we find a perfectly alert older man sitting down on one of those handicapped fold-out shower seats. The shortened conversation goes like this. Hello sir, I'm John and this is Smith. We're paramedics and are here to help. How about we give you a hand and help you stand up? I can't stand up. Yeah we know. That's why your wife called. If you let us take your arms, we can help lift you up. No son, you don't understand. I can't stand up. Take a look at the seat and you'll see what I mean. The construction of this particular shower seat was several wooden slats arranged horizontally with the attachment points of hinges that could swivel just slightly. When the poor guy fell backwards in the shower, he plopped down with such force that the slats opened side to side, allowing just enough space for his nutsack to squeak through, after which the slats promptly snapped back into place, firmly binding him to the chair. We tried to open the slats again, but that only succeeded in applying pressure on things which obviously did not want to be pulled on at that moment. Eventually we called for an engine company, who extricated the poor guy by cutting off the entire seat, which is how he was transported. Never did get to find out how things ended up for him. All emergency response jobs and medical jobs are no longer on my list of fallback positions. Thanks everyone. A real team effort to ensure that if anyone needs to count on me for any medical problem, I will just start vomiting in the corner. LOL if that's how YUO feel, I strongly suggest you do not ever try and take a look at a car accident on the side of the road when you drive by. You may get much, much more than you bargained for. As a volunteer firefighter, I can say I've seen something that is now forever implanted into my brain. While I was in the app bay, doing my training and learning the rigs and whatnot, when I hear this banging on the roll up doors, I run over open it up, and these guys start saying, help my friend, he's bleeding man, hurry up so I run inside, tell the paramedics, they go outside, while I grab the gurney, and when I get there, I notice a younger guy probably in his early 20s with a blood soaked crotch, I begin to think to myself, now why on earth is there blood, all over this guy's pants, right in that region, lol so we get him on board, cut his pants off, and look down there, apparently he went to sit on his drummer's stool, the seat rocked off, and he sat straight down onto the metal, pole which then pierced through his scrotum, and left his testes hanging out, pretty gnarly, luckily he was taking it like a champ, props to him for that, it must have hurt like balls, well he had his hands in his pants the whole time, when we cut the pants off, his fingers were actually inside his scrotum, he didn't know that his nuts were hanging out, or that there was another hole down there. Basically all we did was grab some gauze, place it all down there, not inside, and just drove him with his hand in his nuts. LOL. I thought that was for me, but interesting anyways. LOL. I'm a UK firefighter. One time I had the unluckiest guy. He was a raging alcoholic, and he decided he wanted to end it all by throwing himself from the top of the hospital. So he jumps off, but misses the floor. He hits another roof. So dazed he tries to aim for some metal railings in the hope of impaling himself. He jumps again. Overcompensated for this jump due to previous failed attempt, he hits the wall on the other side and slides down, into an open sewer outlet. Still alive, as it was one of my first days on the job, I was sent in to get him. It's not easy to reason with a drunk homeless guy he literally cannot kill himself wills knee deep in crap and pee. Good times. I had a guy once who accidentally got shot in the butthole with with a spear gun. The spear entered about 2.5 feet into his body. He was alive and laughing. Another time a lady on her way to a hot date was shaving her vag while driving in order to save time. Seems legit. Well she swerved into the bushes and crashed her car about 30 feet deep into the woods. But swerved into the bushes. LOL. Once we responded to a call, African American child, 
4 years old, severe burns on face and shoulders. Turns out his mom had been cooking chicken wings and he reached up and grabbed the pan and pulled it down. Grease burns there were. So, we say we're responding and our eater is 15 minutes. Not 5 minutes pass. Dispatch. 301. 301. Go ahead. Mother reports having applied mustard to baby's burns. A wife's tale in the south. Acknowledged dispatch. 5 more minutes. Dispatch. 301. 301. Go ahead. Mother said the child didn't like the mustard. So she washed it off and applied ketchup. Aside he muttered she won't stay on the dang phone for me to tell her no. At this point, my partner snaps back on the radio. 301. Dispatch. Go ahead 301. 301 wants to know if mother is trying to turn baby into a hot dog. Over. Laughed my butt off until we actually saw the poor little bastard. He looked horrible all burned and condimented. Some people are just too stupid to have children. Yeesh. A relative of mine is a nurse, so she's not necessarily a first responder, but this is still a weird incident. One day she was doing a pelvic exam on a morbidly obese woman. She lifted up one of the lady's fat rolls for some reason and under that roll was her horse. Still in the wrapper, she shows the patient what she found and how does that patient react. The patient takes the ho horse from the my relative and proceeds to eat them during the pelvic exam. Being unaware that there is food on your person due entirely to your level of obesity should be grounds for entry into a mandatory weight loss program. I did a ride along with a police officer once. I was with him from 3.30 to about midnight. The first call of the evening was to a lacrosse game. A player had sustained serious injuries. When we got there the paramedics had already arrived and were dealing with the player. The kid's femur had snapped and punched trough the skin. The bone was jammed deep into the dirt and the kid was in a position where all of his weight was on the snapped femur. Sort of like a half kneel half sit. He used his lacrosse stick to balance. The bone was maybe 3 inches into the ground. Very little blood. Some muscle tissue. I threw up. Eventually the paramedics sedated the kid because he would scream when they tried to move him. Just awful. I went to college for natural resources law enforcement. Didn't really learn much but we heard many stories of our professor's past experiences. So here is one of the weirdest. He was working in a state park in northern Ohio at the time. He got called to the restrooms by an older lady who said that she had seen a man sneak into the women's bathroom and hadn't seen him come out yet. His partner and him went and checked it out and there was no one to be seen. They came back out and asked the lady if she was sure that he hadn't came out yet and she said that she was positive. They went back in just to make sure and they took a look into the toilets. They were the outhouse style bathrooms. And there the man was waist deep in crap covered head to toe in it. I remember a news article about a guy who did this in some outdoor bathrooms at the bottom of a hiking trail. He said he went down there so he could get pictures of girls going to the bathroom. Messed up man. A friend of mine came and talked to a few of my friends about drug abuse. He is a former cop. He told us a story about how a man on PCP got into a dispute with his wife, and eventually escalated to him ripping off his own manhood. With his bare hands, they took him to the emergency room, all the while assuring him, as he requested, that nobody else would touch his manhood until they got him into surgery. I have a friend who is a paramedic, and he got called out to a situation. In a trailer park, 16 year old girl won't tell about the condition. He comes in and finds her with her pants down, white washcloth covering her junk. Long story short, her boyfriend gave her crabs, and with her 16 year old, carnally repressed, trailer trash influenced mind, she thought it was a good idea to spray raid all over her junk. Red swollen genitalia, oozing some sort of pus like discharge. I don't remember what all he did for her other than put her on ice while taking her to the hospital. And the only thing he heard afterwards was that something had to be drained when the doctors took her in. T oh god. That stuff is dangerous if you just spray it in the air around you. I'm none of those things. But my bro is a cop and his wife is an EMT. One of my close friends is an EMT as well so I've heard a few stories. One of the first stories I heard from my brother was during his first month on the job. They got called out to this guy who was walking around with a gun, talking about killing himself. Several cops get there and have weapons drawn in case he points it at them or anyone, but he just keeps it on himself yelling. Well, 
he finally pulls the trigger, no shot goes off, then he does it again, no shot, again, no shot, then like the 4th or 5th time he finally gets the gun to fire and doesn't hit himself well enough to kill himself only blow off half his face and still be alive. I guess that's not funny, but it was a heck of a story for his first not generic call. My EMT friend told me about a guy they had a call for that ended up having a celeb stuck up his butt. They were totally professional, no laughing or anything, all the way to the hospital with the thing running in the ambulance. They kept it together. They get to the hospital and the first thing the doctor says is does he want me to take it out or just change the batteries and they all lost it. Cop buddy of mine once told us about a domestic disturbance call he got. It was two gentlemen. Gentleman A was inserting a mayonnaise jar into gentleman B and inserted it more so than gentleman B preferred. So, enraged, gentleman B hit gentleman A over the head with a frying pan whilst threatening to kill him. After the police arrived the two had to be taken to the air, one to be treated for blunt force trauma to the head, the other for the removal of said mayonnaise jar. The end. Thank god I thought the jar might have shattered. A man, late at night, walks into a with a huge overcoat on backwards. On his crotch region is a huge bulge. The man asks to go see a male doctor immediately, with emphasis on the male. He walks into the room takes off his overcoat and there is a cat, on his dong. He was fricking the cat and because the human dong is too large it killed the cat. Because the cat died, all of its muscles clenched up and the cat was stuck on his dong. TL. DR. Don't frick a cat. I cried a little. Friend who used to be an EMT responded to a call concerned a large woman with diabetes. He ended up becoming friends with her. Dude is seriously the most charismatic mother you'll ever meet. Later down the line, she had to get an above the knee amputation. Some time later, he came to visit her in the hospital. She was in a wheelchair. He was sitting in his own chair. She starts putting the moves on him, punctuated by rubbing her stump against his leg. Needless to say they don't keep in touch. Comma rubbing her stump against his leg. I won't lie, that's kind of adorable. My father told me this story. He was talking to the firefighter chief. Apparently a naked black man broke into the firehouse, got into a battalion chief's office, and began smearing his poop on the walls. When the battalion chief got there apparently he screamed like a little girl. Guy reached out the window and hit the electric wires with a curtain rod. No idea why someone would do this. When you take a big shock like that, there is an entrance wound where you make contact, and an exit wound where the charge returns to earth. Usually this is on the patient's feet, unless of course, in leaning out the window your junk was in contact with the windowsill. TL. DR. Guy manages to burn his junk off completing a circuit. I used to work with a guy who was an EMT in Milwaukee, WI, and said that the stupidest call he got was for a guy who had a big zit on his face. The guy requested to be hauled out by gurney. Sounds about right. I had someone come in by ambulance last week because her foot had been hurting for about 20 minutes. For trauma or injury was just sitting on the couch and her foot was in her words just a little sore and I wanted to make sure it wasn't broken. Searching for a man's nose sliced off by his visor on his motorcycle helmet on first shift. I can't explain the physics but his nose was sliced. Not ground off on the road. With the amount of blood on the helmet visor, we assumed it was the sharp edge. A man with compound fracture of his femur that pieced his car door and pinned him to it. Yes, he went to the hospital with the inner interior part of the door still attached. A guy who stuck a shotgun in his mouth and blew off his head and good portion of the car roof he was sitting in. Old Vokujan Jetta, now with a sunroof. A steel door leading to a marijuana grow up in a house that had a pit dug in the floor on the other side with landscape beams with spikes in them as a trap. Basically, they had it set up so if you kicked in the door and rushed in to rip them off, you would fall in the pit as soon as you rushed in as you would not expect it. Vietnamese punji pit style. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video.
Bye for now.